Next, security and management at the Library of Congress. Last November, the Senate Rules and Administration Committee and the House Oversight Committee heard testimony from Librarian of the Congress, James Billington, and General Accounting and Computer Sciences Corporation representatives. Witnesses discussed the library's collection security, financial management, and general management practices. Oregon Senator Mark Hatfield chairs this four-and-a-half-hour hearing. Is uh, a meeting of the joint, and I felt it appropriate to invite these chairmen of the appropriations committee, as I have indicated, so that we have joined together both the oversight committee and the authorizing committee and the appropriations committee to get a full picture uh, relating to the library. I believe our goal is to see the integrity and availability of the library's collections maximized. Recognizing the library's success in fulfilling this aspiration is dependent upon its ability to function efficiently and effectively. Today's hearing will provide a public forum to discuss a number of important issues concerning the operations of the Library of Congress. We will hear testimony this morning from the U.S. General Accounting Office, Mr. John W. Rinsbarger, Inspector General of the Library of Congress, the Computer Science Corporation, a private security firm hired by the library, and Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress. I would like to thank each of you for taking the time to share with this committee your expertise and knowledge of the Library of Congress. Before I turn to my colleagues for introductory statements, I would like to make two short points. Each of us in this room wants to assist the Library of Congress in protecting and sharing its collection. I look forward to a constructive discussion which reflects our unified commitment to improve the future of the Library of Congress. And number two, I recognize there are a number of contentious issues at the Library of Congress which have recently been brought to our attention. Due to time constraints imposed on all of us during this hectic time of year, we will not be allowed to address each of those items today. It is my intention that today's hearing focus on collection security, financial management, and general management practices at the Library of Congress. However, there are a number of human resource issues at the library, specifically the use of fitness for duty examinations, which deserve to be thoroughly explored by Congress, and I look forward to those discussions at a later date. I now turn to the Vice Chairman of the Joint Committee of the Library, Congressman Thomas, for any opening remarks he would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and with my House colleagues. Uh, to begin, I think, what uh, will be a series uh, of hearings. Um, although the library has come a long way uh, since 1987 when Dr. Billington's uh, appointment was made, uh, during that period we've had the first uh, audit of the library, and obviously with the GAO and a follow-up audit in, I believe, March of 96. So I'm going to look forward to that report, having gone through an auditing procedure in the House, uh, and not yet having come out the other side uh, of that audit, uh, it is in part something um, different than has been done in the past, especially when you bring in uh, outside uh, professional firms. You get to look at yourself in a slightly different way, and I think that's very positive. Uh, it certainly has been a positive uh, experience for us. Uh, as you indicated, I think the focus of this hearing, however, is uh, the information that we learned, for example, uh, in August of this year of potential security concerns at the library with a number of alleged uh, thefts and mutilations of the collections. As Dr. Billington uh, has said, that uh, the library uh, has a mission to make its resources, quote, available and useful to the Congress and the American people and to sustain and preserve a universal collection of knowledge and creativity for future generations. Uh, therefore, uh, any thefts or uh, 
mutilations of the collections are of a direct concern, not just to us, but to all of the American people. Uh, in addition to that, I'm somewhat concerned about internal communications, as we also learned of a letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office alerting the library of its failure to report such incidents uh, to the U.S. Attorney's Office for further investigation. Um, I don't believe one hearing uh, can adequately address the number of issues that uh, we need to look at. Um, because I think we have to look at the past and current role of the library, but more importantly as we move into the digital age, and uh, I'll underscore only briefly the dramatic success that the library has had in terms of uh, providing these collections uh, in a digital way uh, to more and more Americans. And this is an exciting uh, frontier area that the Library of Congress is leading in, especially in its relationship with the private sector in moving forward in this area, not just for funds, uh, but for knowledge and expertise. Uh, the other concern I have, Mr. Chairman, and I know we've talked about this, and I look forward to an ongoing uh, working relationship uh, with you on this joint committee, is that given the scope and the size and the complexity of the Library of Congress, which many people don't appreciate, and hopefully we can bring out to a degree in this hearing today, I believe we need to have an ongoing uh, frontline oversight structure which provides a long-term policy coordinated relatively closely uh, with the management of the library. In addition, uh, it's entirely possible that we may need legislative remedies uh, to address some of these issues, and I expect um, Senate Rules Committee on uh, our side, uh, Committee on House Oversight, uh, perhaps to be called to act in the future to assist in a, a structural or statutory way. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearings. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses uh, that are scheduled to appear today. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I would invite Senator Pell, who is the ranking Senate member, minority member of the Joint Committee on the Library, any opening statement he wished to make. Wishes Thank to you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I congratulate you for holding this hearing under the auspices of the Joint Committee. A number of questions have been raised about significant issues at the Library, and we need to hear the explanations pro and con in the context of this hearing. I applaud your use of the bicameral framework of the Joint Committee for this purpose. I would add that my own interest in this has been with me for a long time. My father was a member of the Joint Committee in 1920, and I've been on it since 1960, and believe that the General has done a wonderful job. I'd like to express the hope at the outset that we view the recent controversies in context and not lose sight of the great progress to which I referred. It seems to me that the library, under the direction of Dr. Billington, has focused its attention on three priority areas. One, human resources. Two, financial management and collections. And three, collections management. As Dr. Billington, I believe, will tell us, there have been positive results in each of those three areas under his guidance. And in the area of security, I would note that there appear to have been a number of significant steps taken to protect the collections even before the latest controversies came to light. This does not mean that everything is perfect or the present inquiry is uncalled for, but it does mean there's a solid foundation of progress at the library on which to base further reform. I'm sure that the, Dr. Billington will embrace the constructive findings of the General Accounting Office and the Computer Sciences Corporation with its customary energy and verve. I look forward to seeing the Joint, li joint Committee on the Library guide these hearings. Thank you, Senator Pell. I call upon Senator Mack, who is the Chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Legislative Affairs. Uh, Senator Mack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, uh, want to uh, thank you for uh, holding uh, this hearing uh, this morning. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that we have ended up where we are today as a result of concerns having to do with security, um, and um, primarily driven from, um, at least as I understand it, uh, an agreement as to the role that the U.S. Attorney would play, a letter from the U.S. Attorney indicating that they were not brought in as uh, they should have been under uh, an earlier agreement. 
Uh, the questions about security eventually led to uh, other areas of concern uh, with respect to the library, uh, human resource questions, uh, financial management uh, uh, questions. Um, in a conversation that I had with um, uh, individuals uh, from the General Accounting Office, uh, they indicated to me that from their experience of a number of years in the field of auditing, that there were sufficient red flags that were being raised as to uh, whether the necessary steps and the necessary procedures and the internal controls mechanisms, questions as to whether those uh, systems were in place, raised enough questions in their mind uh, as to uh, the present uh, situation with respect to financial management at the Library of Congress that I felt that it was important that we take a look at uh, these issues. Uh, and so, I, again, I uh, appreciate uh, uh, the Chairman's uh, willingness to, to hold these hearings and have a, an opportunity to discuss these issues. And I would say, uh, if, if someone is asking, uh, what is the motivation for doing this, I think that the uh, Library of Congress is one of the uh, great treasures uh, that this nation has. Um, and what we all are, are all concerned, uh, what we are driven by, is doing what is in the best interest of protecting uh, that important treasure. So I look forward to uh, the testimony from uh, all of the uh, uh, witnesses this morning. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Mack. And now I turn to the Chairman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Legislative Matters to uh, uh, Congressman Packard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I sincerely appreciate um, being invited to participate in this hearing. I want to compliment you and your Vice Chairman for calling the hearing. There's no question that the Library of Congress is a national treasure, and it is a, a world-class national treasury, treasury uh, to be honest with you. And, and the heart of the Library of Congress are its collections. And those collections need to continue to be made available to the Congress and to the public. And we but they still need to be preserved and protected. And I think that's the function of this hearing, is to find uh, what is being done in that respect. And I'm grateful for the, for the hearing and for the privilege of participating. I have no further uh, prepared statement, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now, uh, Congressman Ney, who is a member of the Joint Committee of the Library. Congressman, happy to have you here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be under the auspices of your chairmanship and also with our vice chairman, uh, Bill Thomas of California. I just wanted to uh, restress uh, and emphasize, I guess, that the collections issue uh, is important. Uh, this is the uh, uh, greatest library, I think, on planet Earth. And it's uh, the magnitude of its outreach across uh, our country is uh, overwhelming in, into the smallest of rural areas or the largest of urban centers. And uh, so I think that the task of the committee is going to be one of uh, importance and, and uh, look forward to working hand in hand with the committee membership and also with the uh, Library of Congress and with the uh, uh, librarian. Uh, beyond uh, the issues of the collections and the protection of it, which is important, I think also we have to delve into and, and uh, appreciate the strategic plan, analyze it, and work with the uh, library to, to see how we take uh, the library into the 21st century. And since we talk about the uh, Cyber Congress now and the whole automation scenario, which we've dealt with on House Oversight, I think that'll be also a crucial aspect to see how we, in fact, actually do uh, make it uh, not only efficient, but take it into the 21st century. So I welcome uh, the working relationship we'll have with you. Thank you, Congressman. Our first panel this morning represents the U.S. At General Accounting Office. <clears throat> the panel consists of Mr. Gadsby in the center, the Director of Government Business Operations Issues, Mr. Robert G. Gramling, Director of the Corporate Audits and Standards, and Ms. Rosemary Jellish, Assistant Director, both from the Accounting and Information Management, Management Division. Uh, we have your full statement, as you have provided the committee. It will be put in the record uh, as such. And you may handle your testimony as you wish at this time, either highlight or summarize or present the entire testimony. It's 
in your hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a very short statement. I think I'll present most of it, although I will, I will summarize. At the beginning, I'd like to take a moment, since we're at the very beginning of our GAO work uh, uh, at this point, to explain the roles of the different people that I have with me. Uh, Bob Grambling, who is the Director of Corporate Audits uh, uh, for the GAO, has been involved over the years in auditing, doing financial audits of government corporations such as the Resolution Trust Corporation, and he's been asked by the Controller General to oversee the financial audit portion of our work at the Library of Congress. Rosemary uh, Jellish ha was the project leader on our uh, initial audit back in 1991, so she's familiar with, uh, with uh, what we found at that point in time, has periodically been in touch with the uh, uh, library concerning its uh, implementation of certain uh, of, of the recommendations and so forth. My role in the uh, in the uh, current audit uh, is to oversee the general management portions of that and integrate all the work uh, with the goal, obviously, of getting done by March and getting a final report to you all. Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, summarize my statement now. We're pleased to be here today to discuss the status of our reviews at the Library of Congress. I will first briefly summarize our 1991 report on the Library's financial management and its response to our recommendations. Then I will explain the uh, uh, status and the scope of our current review. In August of 1991, we issued a financial audit uh, report on the Library's 1988 balance sheet. Since that time, we periodically contracted library officials to discuss their planned corrective actions to address our recommendations. We also testified on a report before the Subcommittee on Libraries and Memorials of the House Administration Committee in November of 1991. In addition, the Library's Inspector General followed up on our work and issued an audit report in August of 1992. Our 1991 audit disclosed three main areas of weakness in the library's financial operations that precluded us from giving an opinion on the library's financial statements. That is a, a situation uh, we have encountered when initially reviewing the financial operations of a number of agencies. The first area of weakness uh, was that the library's financial records and controls were in such poor condition that we were unable to audit a significant portion of its assets and liabilities. The weaknesses in the library's financial management operations also greatly limited its ability to effectively account for and control its collection of about 89 million books and other items. The second area was that the library was unable to produce reliable financial information. It had not uniformly prescribed, documented, or followed the policies and procedures required to effectively account for, control, reconcile, and report financial management information. The third area was that the library's controls over the Federal Library and Information Network, commonly known as FedLink, uh, were weak. As a result, its ability to achieve intended program objectives, namely to provide bibliographic and information retrieval services to federal libraries, and to comply with applicable laws and regulations was adversely affected. Our recommendations fell into two categories. The first related to financial, financial reporting and internal controls. Here we recommended that the library designate a chief financial officer, establish accounting and internal control policies and procedures to assure compliance with federal government accounting principles, and third, to develop an overall financial management improvement plan, which would include audited financial statements as well as an inventory of the collection. The second uh, category of recommendations related to compliance issues. Here we recommended that the library ensure appropriations transferred to the library from other federal agencies were expended only for services provided during the fiscal year for which the appropriations were available. We recommended they seek statutory authority to establish revolving funds to use gifts for self-sustaining activities, to stop accepting non-appropriated funds as reimbursements for FedLink services, to ensure that the prices charged customers under the FedLink program reflect the library's actual cost, and last, to ensure that the number of staff positions financed from Economy Act reimbursements complied with limitations imposed by law. In response to our recommendations, library officials have advised us that the library has designated a director of financial services as its director of financial services as the chief financial officer, adopted accounting and internal control policies and procedures to comply with federal government accounting principles and GAO internal control standards, 
purchased and implemented a new financial management system to comply with the standard general ledger and core financial system requirements and implemented controls over the FedLink program. However, the library has not had a comprehensive financial audit since our initial audit, although its financial management improvement plan um, does call for it to prepare financial statements in 1996 and to have them audited. Although library officials have taken various actions to implement our recommendation, recommendations, a detailed assessment is needed to evaluate the effectiveness of the library's actions. We have recently engaged an independent accounting firm to perform a comprehensive financial audit to evaluate the progress made by the library and to assess the current reliability of the library's financial statements, the status of internal controls, and compliance with laws and regulations. This audit will better position the library to prepare annual audited statements for all library operations. We believe the legislative and judicial branch agencies should prepare audited financial statements on an annual basis in order to put them on a par with major executive branch agencies which are required to have them. Annual independent financial audits are needed to ensure the integrity and reliability of data produced by financial systems. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to shift now to our ongoing uh, uh, management review of the library. In August and September of 1995, there were several news articles, as you know, concerning the library's handling of the investigation and reporting of thefts of rare documents, as well as other matters related to financial and human resources management. Mr. Chairman, on August, uh, on, excuse me, on October 11th, you and uh, Senator Mack asked uh, uh, that we undertake a review of the overall management of the library and complete our work by March 96. Given the time constraints and our recent downsizing, we consulted and reached agreement that it would be necessary to accomplish portions of the work using contractors. We are presently doing some preliminary work to assess the library's operations and identify various management issues that need further study. We are contracting with a management consulting firm to perform the general management aspects of this study. As I mentioned earlier, we have also engaged an independent uh, auditing firm to do the financial uh, audit. We began our work on October 18th by meeting with the librarian and asking for his cooperation and arranging briefings from various service and management support units within the library. Since then, we have been briefed by library managers and observed many of the library's varied operations. We have focused our early inquiries on how the library plans and directs its operations, makes decisions, executes plans, organizes its people and functions, manages its human resources, reviews and evaluates performance, and manages its collections. We expect to complete the uh, preliminary phase of our work uh, and identify specific issues to follow up on and to pursue, and we expect to do that by uh, mid-December and uh, then proceed with the, the more detailed portion of the audit. That concludes my uh, prepared statement. Uh, my colleagues and I would be Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Bramley, do you have any further? No statements. Jellish? Mr. Gadsby, I, I'd like to uh, ask the first question in terms of placing this whole exercise into context. Uh, how would you compare the status of the library's financial management system to that of other federal agencies, uh, such as, let's take the Department of Defense. Uh, does it have a financial system in place that produces annual audits of financial statements? Well, in terms of the, um, in terms of the library's financial system, going back to 91, I think clearly, you know, we found serious problems when we, we audited the, audited the uh, uh, the library's balance sheet at that point in time. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Grambling, who's, who's done a number of these audits and who's probably better, better positioned to do a comparison, if uh, he'd like to add some detail to that. The answer to your question is no, the defense agencies are, are struggling with that. Uh, the Defense Department does not. Does not, and I would say, though, that in terms of trying to put it on some sort of a, a scale, a spectrum, in terms of where the library is, that in initial audits, it's a, it's a common condition that we found at the major federal agencies that they are not auditable at that point. Uh, in terms of trying to look at the seriousness of the problems that we encounter at that time, yeah, I think it's fair to say that uh, 
that the library did have very significant financial management weaknesses. I, I think, aside from the financial management systems and internal controls, and, and, and that is more common in the initial audits, I think the area of the non-compliance with laws and regulations that, were dis that we identified in that initial audit were perhaps uh, more so than we found at other uh, agencies. Dep Department of Housing, HUD? Does it have a, any system in place in terms of producing financial statements uh, on an annual basis? Yes, they do. They do? They do. There are several major agencies out there now that do have auditable financial statements that are getting clean audit opinions, such as SSA, uh, NASA, and, and several others. Uh, but there are many that do not at this point. Energy, Department of Energy? Yes. How many departments of the cabinet would you say have annual financial audits and statements? Approximately half at About this half. point. Yes. Is there any plan to bring the others into a program that would produce such annual statements, such as the $250 billion Defense Department? The recent amendments to the Chief Financial Officers Act of 1990 uh, require the major agencies, 24, uh, to produce financial statements in uh, fiscal year 1996, have those audited, and also requires the General Accounting Office in fiscal year 1997 to conduct an audit of the consolidated statements of the U.S. government. The, uh, would it be fair to say that uh, in spite of the financial management difficulties facing the library, that uh, it's perhaps further down the road on a $200 million budget the Defense Department is on a $250 billion budget? In our follow-up with where the library is with uh, addressing the weaknesses, I, it's, it's pretty clear that they have address the major weaknesses. They have brought in a, a you know, got a CFO on, on board. They have uh, purchased a, a new accounting system. Uh, they have developed uh, policies and procedures uh, related to internal controls. They've got a long-range financial management improvement plan. Uh, the next step, and this is very important, is to have the comprehensive financial audit of the library's operations. I think that's the asset test in terms of are we, are we there yet? Uh. Well, as, as the purpose of my question is not to excuse the library, but to try to put the whole library issue into context of how the government functions in general. <laughs> and uh, I don't see this as a glaring exception, but if anything, it's perhaps with all of its problems, is further down the road than some of the other parts of government that represents far more uh, dollars and far greater influence in the world and nation at large. It, uh, I just want to keep things into context. It's fair to say that, you know, the uh, accounting systems and the major government operations are, are, have been antiquated, outdated, and in need of refurbishing, rebuilding, or, or, or new systems. Uh, and there's a ways to go yet. Thank you, Mr. In 1988, uh, and I don't know who is the person to respond to this question, but the Library of Congress requested that the GAO make an audit, this is 1988, of its financial statements. And this audit was completed in 1991, and I believe the audit suggested, recommended, eight uh, points that were to the GAO uh, would be a, a decided improvement in their financial management. Now, that's been five years. Uh, the question I have is that uh, has the Library of Congress made reasonable progress in implementing those eight recommendations, or where, well, how would you assess that, uh, that uh, audit result? Mr. Chairman, I think that's what the follow-up um, uh, financial audit that we're just beginning is really, uh, as Bob suggested, intended to, to, make to take a analysis. look at, to, that's to go in Senator and... That's what Senator Mack and, and I have requested. That's correct, sir. And uh, uh, I think that's what we're really, we really need, is to go in and basically right. take a look at the effectiveness with which that's been implemented. Did I hear you say that in December you might have some uh, preliminary... Uh, 
report? I don't believe, no, not in December. I think in December what we hope to have in, in two or three weeks from now, basically uh, for the other portion of the uh, uh, study, the general management portion, if you will, we hope to define uh, there the specific issues that we will pursue between December and the completion of the work in March of 1996. Mark. In terms of when we would have a preliminary indication, perhaps Mr. Grambling would have an idea. On the financial audit, uh, uh, we have tasked our contractor, Price Waterhouse, to give us an initial assessment of the auditability of the library by mid-December. And that work has, has started. So I would hope at that point to at least know that the financial statements are auditable. I will not know at that time, though, the grade that we would give them. In other words, uh, are their statements fully auditable? Are they partially auditable that our opinion would be qualified? But I will know whether we will be able to conduct the audit at that time. <clears throat> and I would add that uh, if we determine <clears throat> that the statements may not be audible at that time, we would proceed then to develop and identify those areas that need attention so that the library can achieve that, uh, that goal. <coughs> The revolving gift fund, I believe, was one of those points made in the 1991 audit. Yes. Uh, as I understand, uh, it, it was stated in that audit, the library had exceeded its statutory authority in the manner in which they handled the revolving gift fund. Uh, as you probably know, the library has submitted to the Congress legislative request and the Congress each year and the Congress has not acted. I would hope that possibly you could look at and uh, so we have some responsibility in that particular assessment of how much progress is made on those recommendations. I would like to have you also look at other than statutory possibilities of adjusting that problem that you pointed to because of the failure of the Congress to respond to the request of the library. Maybe Congress will be more responsive in the next session, I don't know. But let's look at some other alternative in the absence of the congressional action that could correct that uh, issue that you, you focused on. We'll be glad to take a look at that. Thank you. Uh, I turn now to uh, Congressman Thomas, our Vice Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you in your um, attempt to find a comparison within the federal government that you stayed with the executive branch, because had you tried to make a comparison with any area in the legislative branch, it would have been much worse. Uh, after all, the Library of Congress talked about uh, a financial audit in 1988 through 91. We did not talk about a financial audit in the House of Representatives until the new majority in January of this year. And not surprisingly, we found uh, virtually uh, the same uh, identifiers, that is, uh, as was described uh, by Mr. Gadsby, that they really couldn't audit it, that they couldn't provide reliable financial uh, reports, and that they were not strong in carrying out their duties. One of the difficulties that we have had, notwithstanding that, and then uh, a audit following the audit to try to get some particulars uh, nailed down, uh, our difficulty in putting in place uh, a financial management system within a time frame that will allow us to be auditable. Uh, it's one thing to go in and say the books are in such condition that we can't make a decision. It's quite another to take that and translate it into a structure in which the next financial audit would in fact uh, uh, be one that would be worthwhile. I guess my first question would be that following the 1988-1991 uh, non-audit, uh, when would it have been, uh, in your mind, uh, appropriate uh, to go back in and attempt a financial uh, audit, understanding you have to put uh, a structure in place? The House of Representatives is doing it in a fishbowl, and uh, we're committed to having it done uh, by early next year, and I can just tell you it's an extremely difficult process when you start uh, with what we had to, uh, to start with and put in place uh, a truly professional audito auditable uh, financial system. 
You're exactly right. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult process to uh, bring in a, a new system, whether you're developing it in-house or even buying one off the, off, off the shelf. And uh, even once you get that system somewhat installed, there are, there's a shakedown period. There's going to be bugs just like any other uh, new item that comes into an agency. You need to test that and, and, and ultimately see if it's operating like you hoped it would based on your needs determinations and requirements, et cetera. Uh, in the process of doing that, uh, you do need to check how you're doing. And uh, it, it may be something less than a comprehensive financial statement audit at that point. Uh, you may know that you're not quite there yet to do that, but I think you do need to keep tabs and scorecard on how you're doing, if you're meeting your milestones, et cetera, so that uh, at least uh, you're on schedule to, with accordance with your plans. We are looking at off-the-shelf uh, items, and we've discovered one inside the executive branch we think will work. I believe the Library of Congress did much the same thing and is in the process of putting it into effect. With the advantage of hindsight, when might it have been appropriate in your estimation, if you're able to, to answer the question, that we perhaps could have done uh, a, a kind of a where are you state of uh, the art change audit? And would it have been worth the money had it been done in 93 or 94 or even this year? The library had planned in, uh, it, it, in its long range financial management improvement program to be at the point where it would have a financial audit of its fiscal year 1996 financial statements, which means that the audit would take place in fiscal 97, trying to review what had happened the year before in fiscal 96. Uh, with the request that we received uh, and with the library's cooperation, we are accelerating that schedule. Uh, we're actually bringing them on board one year earlier. I think it's fair to say that, you know, there are some concerns as, at, at this point as the library is still in a shakedown mode. If it, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit more complicated at this time to uh, accelerate that schedule. Uh, my own view is, though, that I think that's a productive way to go. Uh, looking at the basic improvements that they've tried to make, I think we're just going to push that time schedule ahead and uh, Hopefully, uh, I, I feel confident that the, the library uh, will be better for it uh, because we'll get the specific determination that, you, that they need. And I think they are in a shape now that they're far enough along that a comprehensive audit uh, uh, is, is appropriate. Take a step back. Mr. Gadsby, you talked about uh, um, contracting with the financial uh, auditing firm Pricewaterhouse, which is the uh, firm that we used. And you indicated that they're going to be doing, I believe, the financial, but they're going to be doing management as well, or not? Price Waterhouse, uh, no, the financial firm will just do the financial audit. We are, we are working separately to contract with another manager. you do not have consultant. a contract yet for the financial? We do for the financial, yes. You do, and that's with? That's with Price, Price Waterhouse. That's with Price Waterhouse. The management contract is not yet. We have not entered into a contract as yet. Aren't both of those kind of critical to, to, to compare, especially with the initial 8891 concern about a chief financial officer and whether or not there are clear lines of responsibility and that structure has been established on a management side, notwithstanding the financial management service, which is a structure that could be separate? I'm concerned about the coordination of the two and, and a clear understanding of where we are and what needs to be done. No, there will there will be uh, extensive coordination. Uh, Who will be uh, of doing that? Contracts. Okay, we at the GAO will be doing that. Uh, Bob will be overseeing, basically, the financial uh, uh, contractor. Uh, I I will be overseeing the work that will be done by the the general management uh, firm when we select one. So, in building terms, and you'll be the general contractor, and these two folks will be, be the, the general subs. contractors. Okay. That's right. And and we expect also there will be a portion of this that we will be doing ourselves. And so, uh, come March of 1996, there will be a need to integrate uh, uh, the work that's been done. Uh, actually, we'll do that along the way. But we'll need to have a single product that we'll bring to you all that will integrate the results uh, of all three efforts. Uh, just a minute or two on your role as a general overseer. 
uh, you're going out to the private sector for both uh, the specifics of the finances and, and the management. Are you setting the parameters for, for them to go in, or are they simply coming in and using a typical uh, business private sector profile, uh, or are they going to be coordinating it as they go along? What, what, what's the, what's the charge and how is it focused, I guess, there, is what I'm saying. There, is, there are two answers to this, uh, and uh, I'll work on the general management. There are only two. We're ahead of the game. Well, it's, okay. The, uh, with respect to the general management contractor, we will work with them to identify the issues uh, that are to be uh, pursued in detail after the, the mid-December time frame and so forth. So they, they will not... Uh, in and of themselves uh, select uh, what it is they're going to look at. Uh, there are very specific things in the request that we got from Senators Hatfield and Mack uh, that, uh, that uh, we are to give some attention to, and, and we will give attention uh, to those, either through the contractor or through our own audit work. So with respect to the financial audit, um, uh, the GAO does have a prescribed methodology, if you will, for carrying that out. The, uh, the firms which we retain uh, have uh, experience in executing that methodology, so they would be using that uh, methodology for the financial audit of the library. Uh, and finally, Mr. Chairman, my concern is that um, notwithstanding the long history of, of the Joint Committee, perhaps there has not been as much direct involvement in setting general policy guideline and then uh, overseeing uh, those aspects that we believe to be fundamentally important. And my concern is that as we enter this second phase, uh, clearly uh, GAO is moving on the direction of the chairman and gentleman from, from Florida, but that perhaps we might need to take a step back and look at what they're going to be doing with the changes that the library has contemplated from a management point of view and make sure that we maximize the result of this both financial and management audit to lay the groundwork for where we want to go rather than simply get a report card and then decide what no. are we going to do with what we now have. No, I, I think that's a good idea. We would, as a regular of course, expect to work with uh, your respective staffs as far as advising of them of the issues and so forth. Uh, in addition to that, the library itself has a number of contractors on board looking at security and other issues and so forth, and we would expect to be, con you know, to be coordinating our work uh, with those contractors as well. And I guess more fundamentally, I, I, I understand the concerns and the sensitivities, but I don't think money is well spent when you react either to real or supposed problems and that you're constantly reacting and that what we need to do is look at a long-term policy and strategy so that not only the um, audits from GAO but activities of the library are coordinated toward a, a known end that we all agree upon and I think that will maximize the expense that we're going through now because uh, I think we want to get it right the first time. I Thank couldn't you, agree Mr. more. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pell. Thank you. We're joined by Congressman Ed Pastor of Arizona, who is a member of the Joint Committee of the Library. Congressman? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We also have a reserved a place at the beginning of the hearing for any opening statement that you may wish to enter. I'll submit it for the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry I was late, but I had some other business. O only have one question. Uh, I was reading through the uh, different material provided to us, and I think uh, Ms. Uh, Jellish uh, brief to staff, as I understand it, and in the comment it is said that you stated to the staff that you consider the library to have made progress implementing changes to respond to the audit findings and recommendations. Could you elaborate on that for, for my own information? The library has made progress. They have, as Mr. Grambling stated earlier, uh, appointed a CFO um, adopted a financial management improvement plan, uh, is implemented a new financial management system. Uh, at this point, we would like to have this financial audit done so that we can assess the effectiveness of the actions that they have taken. Going through the oversight uh, and preparing financial efforts for the House, is, which is 
Chairman Thomas has just explained, has been an effort. We were very enthusiastic in getting it done very quickly, but we found ourselves that it's going to take longer than we had anticipated. Uh, and I've also read through the material that the library has considered itself to finish, I think it was eight uh, recommendations and have uh, two open. Uh, of those eight, do you, are you satisfied that they have uh, finished or closed eight recommendations and the two outstanding are the big ones? Uh, is that what I'm hearing you tell us? The Eight major recommendations, uh, six have been implemented. Uh, the, the two that are open, uh, one of which is in the long-range financial management improvement program and, and, and really calls for a comprehensive audit, as Rosemary said, to test the effectiveness of the changes that have been made. Uh, the, the other one deals with the uh, need for legislation to deal with the revolving fund issue that we identified. But in, uh, and I agree with uh, Chairman Thomas that uh, it's the long-term issues. Once everything is uh, prepared so we can audit, then what, what is the long-range plan? So I, I guess your assessment is that the library has been cooperative in trying to implement the recommendations. And it's only because the task is a lot greater than all of us thought that it hasn't been able to accomplish uh, at least one of the remaining two. Uh, obviously, the other one is a congressional action rather than uh, pre preparation of uh, records, et cetera. Yeah, I believe we said in the 1991 report that this was a long-term effort that right. they needed to engage in, and uh, uh, I, I believe that's, you know, it was accurate then and is accurate, uh, is accurate today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Mack. I was uh, sitting here. Back, you let me interrupt. But you notice we're going by the joint committee procedure first, and then Absolutely. to the appropriators. I understand that there is no lesser role, but just a pattern we're following. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I was listening to the discussion, I was wondering um, how I would um, begin my comments, and, I, and I, um, the discussion of, of audits and internal controls and management reviews. Um, brought back an um, earlier part of my life when I was uh, in the banking business. And um, um, as president of a small bank, I've uh, had to deal with um, uh, auditors of uh, all types uh, from many different agencies, um, including uh, an audit process uh, which management put in place, internal controls and so forth, plus uh, a paid uh, big Eight, as it was referred to in those days, accounting firm to come in. Um, and, and again, the, the thought process that I went through as I was listening to this discussion is I can remember reports coming back uh, uh, to uh, me as the president of the bank and also to the board of directors in which there would be a thorough discussion with management about uh, the recommendations made um, by the various audits uh, and the follow-up procedures necessary to put these in place. All of that is to kind of set the stage and, 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 and ask the question. In 1991, uh, it's, everybody is aware of you've made a number of recommendations and raised, frankly, I think, think fairly serious concerns back in 1991. The question is, what were you expecting to happen as a result of that? I mean, the, the, I think the question here for me really is, is not whether it's certain things have been, been put in place, but did the library act um, quickly enough? Um, and I, again, what's going through my mind too is uh, I believe that the IG requested additional funding in 1991 or 1992 to carry out the suggestions that you all made. Um, maybe it's, I'm not quite sure who to address this question to, maybe to Ms. Uh, Jealous, uh, since she was the one that uh, performed the audit. Are you surprised to find uh, that we're sitting here in 1995 um, without your being able to say that the recommendations that you made in 1991 with some concern have, that you can't report to us that in fact they've been put in place, that uh, these internal controls uh, do in fact function? Uh, and the objective uh, has been reached. Um, give me your reaction. Well, as we said in our report, it, it is a long-term process to uh, 
take care of the weaknesses that we found. Um, as to how long it should take, that's difficult to say. Uh, long term, yes, I, I really couldn't say. Well, then I'm going to give you. I'm, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to that. I think uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we would look for, not only at the library or but at other locations, is whether or not the agency is is basically uh, uh, taking our recommendations seriously, and uh, whether they're uh, moving on them in a serious way. Um, we uh, attempt really to follow up on all the recommendations that the GAO makes. We have a process by which we uh, put them into a database. We have a process where whereby every six months, basically, we, we, we have the uh, individuals who actually did that audit uh, get back with and check with the agency officials uh, who are implementing those and to try and get some sense of the status of that. It's pretty much an, uh, uh, a process that takes place uh, uh, by telephone. There are some documents that come to us and so forth. But we try to do it with the people who are most knowledgeable of the work that was done and the recommendations that are made so we can make some judgments about uh, um, whether, whether or not the, the uh, agency is responding seriously to those. Uh, we do go on, in some cases, go back and actually verify uh, what has been done. Uh, and uh, that is exactly what we'll be doing as part of this audit. And so I think uh, come March, I think we'll be in a bo real good position to, to make some, have a real solid answer to your question. Uh, whereas at this point, um, uh, the work that we've done in terms of follow-up has been, been pretty much this uh, every six months checking with the agency and uh, uh, receiving some documentation, but not going into test and verify. So it would be fair to me con to conclude at this time that you believe that during this interim period of uh, five years uh, or four years or so that the uh, Library of Congress has been acting seriously and in a timely manner? And I guess another way to say that is that, um, that I might be overreacting that, uh, that this is a too long of a period given the uh, concerns that you raised in 1991? Yeah, I would say that they've been serious. I don't, I don't know that I could comment on the timely issue myself. Bob, would you have? They have a, had a gigantic problem to deal with. There's no question. You could look at the front end and say, geez, did they spend too much time trying to do their needs determination, systems requirement, trying to evaluate whether they need a new system. There was some time. The, ticked off the clock when they were doing that. Once that decision was made, though, and I would preface it, too, that in the response to our draft report, uh, the response was very positive in agreement with the recommendations. And they began, and they had already taken st some steps at that time and then what got into this mode of trying to look at their system and, and whether that was their system that existed was the one that they needed to go forward or a new system. That took a fair amount of time. Once that decision was made, though, the, uh, the system was installed, I believe, within one year. Uh, but then again, you've got the shakedown that's necessary to do that. And in the interim, while they're doing that, they we were working on uh, their long-range plan and uh, specific controls, policies, and procedures. So it, they were definitely serious about uh, making improvements. And I think it's a judgment call as to, geez, if we threw more money at it, people, et cetera, could we be a, a little further ahead? Perhaps. Okay. I, I, for, for now, I think that's the only question that I have, uh, and we'll await um, uh, your report in March and any interim information that you want to share with us. Thank you, Senator Mike. Chairman Beck. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think the questions that I've had have been uh, in some ways addressed. Perhaps just a, as a follow-up, um, You've indicated and we've discussed uh, the implementation process uh, after your recommendations, but that you, and you've also indicated that it will take a, uh, another audit review to determine what kind of progress has been made relative to the new financial management system and uh, the other implementation procedures that the library has undergone. Um, do you have a sense, however, that what they have done is, is, is solving the problem? Uh, do you have some preconceived feelings about the outcome of your of your analysis that that maybe there are some weaknesses yet or there's some things yet not being done or are the recommendations uh, really going to solve the problem? I think the answer to that lies in conducting the financial statement audit. Uh, installing a new system does not in itself cure the extensiveness of the problems that we found at the 
at the library and, and, and to be, you know, it doesn't deal with the collection and getting the accountability for that national treasure that is needed. You've also got some very detailed requirements in terms of reconciliations with other systems that are necessary. These are the types of things that uh, we we'll, would be checking on and, uh, and also the new system certainly doesn't uh, achieve compliance with laws and regulations, although the Inspector General's follow-up audit in 92 did find that th those practices had uh, been prohibited and, and that the, uh, the compliance was now there, with the exception of the revolving fund issue that we talked about that needed legislation. So there are still major questions that are unanswered, which the financial audit hopefully will provide answers to those questions. What, are, what other areas of, uh, that do you sense will need attention beyond the, uh, the implementation of a new financial management system? The, the daily chores, if you will, of successfully doing that. I mean, there are a number of subsystems, some of which are integrated with the new system, some are, are not. They've got manual interfaces. It's important, though, that all those be in sync and you've got reconciliations that are being done. Uh, the library, it's, it's pretty obvious, has attended to the major ones. There are some, though, that, that in the, the operations that are outside the, uh, the CFO's area but are important for the financial audit that, uh, that we'll need to look at. And, and, and also the accountability for the collection. I think with the new accounting standards uh, that have just come out by the Federal Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, we won't try to place a value on the collection and put it on the financials as an asset, but it's still an important accountability issue and you would end up as a supplemental schedule to your financials and there you'd want to discuss the collection in terms of items in your controls, et cetera. And so that still needs to be done. I mean, they're in the process of inventorying. It's not done yet. Uh, progress is being made. So there are still very important major issues that putting in a new system just doesn't do for you. Will your agency be reviewing the uh, security uh, uh, arrangement for the library? Yes, and that's, and that's a, an area that, uh, that as the general contractor, uh, we'll be coordinating here with the various subs, if I use that uh, analogy there, because the collection overlaps both from the operations as well as financial management standpoint. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gadsby, uh, Ms. Jellish, and Mr. Brent. I ask one additional question. Sure. Um, and, and maybe this is too early, but uh, are you of the opinion that you will be able to audit, to give a, uh, an opinion on the Library of Congress based on what you know now? On their financial statements? Yes. I hate to speculate. Uh, that's why we tasked the uh, contractor to give us an answer by mid-December. Uh, and the process that will go through that will to go in and you know get a firm understanding of the specifics that we've been talking about here this morning, some of the details, the reconciliations. Okay, and the reason I'm going to I'm going to press you a little bit is because um, um, in in private conversations with other members of GAO. Uh, and again, I, I draw this on, again, having spent a few years in the financial industry, uh, who uh, they, they pretty much uh, indicated to me that uh, their 35 years of experience in this area said that there were sufficient red flags raised uh, that caused real concern as to whether they're going to be able to get audited statements. Now, I'm asking you as, as, as a professional who's been at this, are there sufficient red flags? There are sufficient red flags, uh, certainly in the terms of whether the op opinion that can be rendered uh, will be qualified or, or not. Uh, I think putting in the, the financial management system that they've got, uh, which meets internal control and accounting standards, was a major step. And certainly that gives you properly implemented good fund control. I think where the jury's kind of out is on the proprietary side, the business operations, et cetera, where you've got manual interfaces and not automated faces, whether all that's going to gel together. And that's a, it, it is a, a major uncertainty. All right. Uh, Vice Chairman Thomas. 
Very briefly, I want to follow up to Mr. Packard's question, which the response, I want to clarify it, uh, where you talked about uh, going in and beginning to place a value on uh, some of the collection, and pretty obviously some of it you can't place a value on. And I know that there are individuals who own, in essence, priceless artworks and others, and that oftentimes you don't even bother with insurance. You make sure your security system is adequate so no one can get in. Uh, we're talking about uh, anything that the library does as fairly intensive uh, human resource-wise, uh, even inventorying, but taking time to begin to determine the value of some items that, that uh, frankly, would be very difficult to determine. I'm concerned about that. And I want you to expand a little bit uh, on that. Are we talking about committing them to expending uh, people power to try to go through the process of putting uh, evaluations on, on items? The answer is, is, is no. Uh, I think there was some discussion, and, and again, accounting standards changed at the time that we did the initial audit. Uh, that was an issue as to whether a monetary value should be placed on the collection. Uh, since that time, the, uh, the creation of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and they've got categories now that they call like heritage ash assets and certain items that uh, the decision has been made, like in the space program, some of the defense assets, weapon systems that, uh, given their purpose, uniqueness, useful lives, etc., that perhaps it, it, it wasn't uh, necessary, if you will, from an accounting standpoint, to spend resources to try to put a value on those. But the accountability issue was not relinquished. You've got to have good controls over those assets and good disclosure. I have no problem with that, and I guess that's part of the long-range policy Correct. that I want to make sure that we begin to get into, because if someone had come to me indicating we wanted to take resources of the library to begin to try to place valuations on some of these, I would be much more concerned about the accuracy of what they have and the security of protecting what they have rather than spending time trying to determine what some of these items uh, were worth. So I'm glad somebody made a U-turn, but my concern is that there was time and energy and taxpayer dollars expended going down what I consider to be an inappropriate cul-de-sac. That's just an example of the kind of things that I think we could at least play some partial role in in the guidance as to what you look at. And I guess I'm even more concerned now about what the management and the financial uh, uh, audits are, are going to look at. And I look forward to you giving us an overview of where we go. Well, I definitely say neither the management of the financial audit is going to expend resources trying to value the collection. Our resources will be spent looking at the controls. That was, I guess, an example. There probably are additional ones that may come up, and so I'd prefer looking at the overall direction. Again, having just experienced uh, with some degree of pain the uh, attempt to audit the House of Representatives and the follow-up uh, in trying to make sure that it works, I don't think the analogy is unfair, uh, uh, and the library has had a little bit of a head start. Well, we'll Thank be you, more Mr. than Chairman. happy to brief you, the other members and staff, on, on where we intend to go with the specifics. I guess what I'm saying is I'm less interested in a briefing than that the Joint Committee has a shared understanding of where we want to go with the library, and the GAO right. understands that as it oversees examining the library and offering recommendations as to what the library should do to go where we believe it should go. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Thomas. I hope that you uh, people will be able to remain in case questions arise out of uh, subsequent testimony. It would be referred back to you. Thank you. Our second witness in of the day is the Library of Congress Inspector General, Mr. John W. Rensbarger. Fielding questions along with Mr. Rensbarger will be the Assistant Inspector General for the investigations Mr. Kenneth R. Keeler. Mr. Rensbarger has been with the Library of Congress since 1983, first serving as its chief internal auditor until 1988, when he was promoted into his current position as Inspector General. His auditing experience runs deep. He has served such federal agencies as the United States Department of the Treasury, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Defense. Mr. Rensbarger, we welcome your testimony at this time. We have your printed statement, and we'll be happy to 
hear you either read it or summarize it as you wish. And I note that you have a further assistant with you, uh, Ms. Anita Scala. So we uh, welcome you here today. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, because my statement is brief, let me read it into the record, if you don't mind. Uh, would you call, pull the microphone a little bit closer? Yes, thank you. Chairman Hatfield, Vice Chairman Thomas, and members of the Joint Committee on the Library, uh, and the Appropriations Committee, and the Oversight Committee. I am pleased to appear before you this morning. I would like to introduce Mr. Kenneth Keeler, who's my assistant IG for investigations, and Ms. Anita Scala, who's my assistant IG for audits. Um, Ken will address any questions you may have regarding the thefts and mutilation of the library's collections. Anita and I will discuss any questions you have relating to audits within the Library of Congress. I'd like to begin initially by addressing the need for a statutory Inspector General at the Library of Congress. I have been in the Inspector General community since its creation uh, by the 1978 Inspector General Act. Prior to 78, I served in various audit positions. I am therefore aware of those conditions which prompted the Congress to pass the Inspector General Act. And it was those similarities between the conditions I call pre-1978 to the conditions I saw at the library which prompted me to request statutory authority for the Inspector General position in August of 1989 and again in October of 94. In June of this letter, this year, when I drafted the letter to Mr. Albert McDermott, who was then the Majority Staff Director on the Committee of Rules and Administration, it was from a sense of frustration at not being able to do a job that I was being paid to do. I was also told that by sending my letter across the street, I was hurting the institution. I want to make it clear that it was never any intention on my part to malign the institution or the individuals who make up that grand institution, which we call the Library of Congress. But it was for me a matter of conscience. I knew and felt that I could do a better job, but I needed to be truly independent, not just having the appearance of being independent. So the issue here is whether a non-statutory IG or Inspector General at the library is independent. In my opinion, I would say no. The General Accounting Office, in describing independence, talks about external in impairment to independence. They state, restriction on funds or other resources provided to the audit organization that would adversely affect the audit organization's ability to carry out its responsibilities. That is an external impairment. Since 1990, I have repeatedly requested additional staff. And since 91, which was for fiscal 93, uh, I requested funds to perform financial statement audits at the library. I was never formally refused, but the funds were never forthcoming. The Office of the Inspector General's first criminal investigator was hired in February of 1995. That's seven years after the initial request, but I had to sacrifice an auditor's position. In the letter I wrote to Mr. McDermott, and that's the letter that seems to be creating a lot of controversy, everything was factually correct as of June 29, 1995. However, since the incidents involving the collection and the letter to Mr. Holder occurred in August, and since Mr. Harris had expressed some interest um, and made inquiries into the inspector, about the Inspector General's office, there have been significant positive movements or improvements. Where previously I had no budget, every effort is now being made to secure a budget for my office. Previously, additional staff had not been approved for my office. I am now in the process of hire, having five new positions classified and hopefully filled within the next six months. Additional and secured office space, which had previously been delayed, should be forthcoming next month. And the chief of staff of the library is now in the process of resolving old audit findings and recommendations. And the prospects that our office, computers, which are five and six years old and some very outdated, will be replaced are extremely bright. 
these changes were brought about as a result of, of those incidents that we know about in August and are further indications of our lack of independence. Had there been a statutory inspector general at the Library of Congress, the referrals to the United States Attorney would never have been an issue. The Inspector General Act requires that all violations of federal criminal law be made directly to the United States Attorney. The Act also requires the use of a seven-day letter whenever the Inspector General becomes aware of serious or flagrant problems, abuses, or deficiencies relating to the administration of programs and operations. This letter is transmitted via the head of the agency to the Congress, but it has to be transmitted. Then there is the semi-annual report, which is submitted to Congress for the six-month periods ending March 31st and September 30th of each year. The Act also gives the Inspector General the authority to issue documentary subpoenas and to administer oaths. It is my opinion that the Inspector General position had been statutory. Some, but not all, of the collection mutilation problems could have been avoided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ken and Anita and I are now ready for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rensbarger. Mr. Rensbarger, you assert, and I quote, had there been a statutory inspector general at the Library of Congress, the referrals to the United States Attorney would never have been an issue. Since the Inspector General Act requires that all violations of federal criminal law be made to the United States Attorney, unquote. Are you saying that you were aware of violations of federal law but did not report them to the U.S. Attorney because you were not a statutory IG? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that had we been statutory, it would have been obligatory for those offenses to have been reported to our office. Once they were reported to our office, we would have then been obligated to report them to the U.S. Attorney. Well, let me go back to the first part of the question. Uh, are you aware of violations of federal law? No, we're not. But what does happen is that the police force do become aware of federal criminal violations, and they were not reporting them to our office. They were reporting them to, I believe it was the Superior Court of D.C. Well, Mr. Rensbarger, let me ask you then a follow-up question. What was the problem? that uh, those who were aware of the violations were reporting them to proper authorities in the library so that the U.S. Attorney could be informed? What was happening? My understanding is that the police were reporting violations to the Superior Court in the District of Columbia, and therefore, some of the ones that they were aware of. Um, and not, therefore, to our office, so the U.S. Attorney could have been informed. But you weren't aware of it. We were not aware of it. Mr. Rensberg, are you involved in the investigation of the actions of Detective Maceda and her immediate superiors and the actions taken in response to her allegations? No, I'm not. Mr. Keeler is. Now, you say in your statement that you were told that sending your letter across the street would hurt the library. Who told you this? I had a, we'd had a meeting um, with Dr. Billington um, shortly after he became aware of the fact that I had sent the letter over, which was about two weeks ago, and he indicated that I had, hurt, had seriously hurt the agency by doing that. Dr. Billington said yes. that to you. Mm -hmm. In August of this year, uh, Computer Sciences Corporation was contracted to do a two-day walkthrough of the library examining the status of its security system and offering recommendations for improvement. CSC was subsequently contracted by the library to perform a more in-depth study, as you know, of its security with a report due sometime next year. Uh, please explain what role your office has had in the CSC study. Do you believe there is an opportunity and reason to further your office's role in these proceedings? Okay, let me turn that over to Mr. Keeler because he's dealing with the CSC contract and the security. Uh, yes, Senator, I, I think there is a role for, for the IG to play uh, with respect to in security improvements, collection security improvements. We were instrumental in working with Dr. Billington and finding very quickly uh, specialists to come in and take a look at physical security and take appropriate action very quickly. Uh, we're, 
we are waiting to we're, we're patiently awaiting the outcome of, of their survey, although we, we do consult with them periodically. Uh, but certainly there's a we, we, we envision a close relationship once physical security measures are in place, not only uh, the physical security uh, measures themselves, but also more importantly, uh, some sort of guideline and procedure that uh, this contractor will put in place. Then we can hold people accountable for violations of security. In other words, your role would be primarily reviewing, first reviewing their proposals and then what implementation and review or monitoring such implementation would be. Yes, sir. We don't profess to be security experts, so we stay away from the recommendations. What we're looking at is how can we hold people accountable for violations of security that expose the collection to theft and mutilation. So that that comes later after CSC's uh, recommendations are made more important role than at the moment, at this moment yes, while they're sir. in process. Thomas. Hey, Mr. Chairman, we just heard um, a discussion of an expanded program to conduct financial and management uh, audits of the Library of Congress, and GAO testified uh, of their involvement uh, in these new audits. Have you folks been involved in that process? If so, how? And if not, why? Are you talking about the financial statement audits? I'm talking about the fact that there's going to be an ongoing financial audit and a management audit. We heard from GAO that they were going to be kind of the general contractors, uh, and then they're going to subcontract uh, many of these other functions to uh, private firms that they're going to contract with. Have you folks, as the Inspector General of the Library of Congress, been involved in the process? If so, how? If not, why not? Our involvement up to date has just been working with GAO, having them sit down and talk to us and tell us what they're going to do. That's been the extent of our involvement. Um, are, are, you, are you coordinating with them? Are you going to have a role to play with them? At this stage, I can't answer that question, honestly, because we haven't touched base with them as to what we're going to be doing. My understanding is that they will be working on their own, but they will touch base with us to make sure there's no overlap of work. No but overlap of work. What work will you be doing in that area? No, we have a regular audit program that we intend to um, give us a list of work to do for the year. And to the extent that there would be an overlap, we would back off. Now, I can't go through the audit program and say these are all the areas. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60, 70 audits that are on that pro program, and I couldn't name them all. Uh, once again, the analogy is not inappropriate to the House of Representatives uh, and apparently the Library of Congress. We have an uh, inspector general. He's not statutorily independent, but he has a line item appropriation. And uh, prior to this Congress, the uh, inspector general had two staff. Uh, to carry out uh, activities in the House of Representatives. Uh, with the new majority in January of 1995, we expanded that staff to 18. Uh, and uh, they're working full-time, all of them. Uh, and it was through the IG that we carried out the contract with Pricewaterhouse and had as, in essence, the general contractor, the inspector general uh, of the House. Uh, notwithstanding the difficulties uh, that you've had, Mr. Rensbarger, uh, uh, without having, uh, in your opinion, sufficient staff or uh, independence, uh, did you, uh, in your role as the Inspector General uh, in the recent past, attempt to involve yourself in financial audits with the Library of Congress? Yes. We have been involved, and in the past we were involved with the General Accounting Office at the time they did the 1988 financial statements. And any time the GAO would come in, they would touch base with us to let, the, let us know they were on, on board and what they were going to do. Um, in this particular case, the way everything happened so quickly, um, we were just never involved in it. It was but all was done there any without time, us. Was there any time between the, between the period 1991 and today that you indicated uh, to the librarian or to the appropriate management uh, personnel that you thought there should be a uh, follow-on financial audit? Yes, we did perform a financial follow-on audit to the GAO. When was that? Um, in 92. 
in 92. Yes. Was it, was it, would you call it a comprehensive financial audit? No, what we did on the finan that report, we looked at the recommendations that the General Accounting Office had proposed. We then followed up on all those rec findings and recommendations. And at the time, we felt that the library was making significant improvements in accomplishing or achieving those findings and rec or the recommendations. So basically, you were monitoring whether or not the library was uh, beginning to respond uh, appropriately to uh, the initial GAO audit. That's correct. I guess my question is directed more toward carrying out a comprehensive financial audit uh, by the IG mm -hmm. internally. Was that ever requested? We proposed to do follow-on financial statement audits in beginning in fiscal 93, and we proposed it again in 94 and 95. Um, the reason why I 93 was because after we had sat down with GAO, after we had reviewed their draft report and then, of course, their final report, um, we were putting the budget together for fiscal 93. So for fiscal 93, I proposed doing another financial statement audit. The purpose of doing the financial statement audit, because we have we thought that the recommendations might still be the same, but we were concerned about the balances. One of the problems we had in the initial audit that was done by GAO was that we had to hire another CPA firm to come in and just establish the opening balances for the 88 statements. So what we were attempting to do was, number one, make sure that the balances, opening balances and closing balances remain current, we also were trying to establish a benchmark on a yearly basis as to the improvements the library was making against that GAO um, report. And this was a request that you made? Yes, it was. And was it uh, agreed to? We never received the funds. So obviously it wasn't agreed to. And you renewed that request in 94? Yes. And again in 95? Not in 95. 95, we never received the budget call. Okay. In your opinion, had any of those actions been taken in either 93 or 94, could have moved uh, the library more rapidly in the direction that apparently we're now looking at in terms of where we would like to go following this uh, new attempt to create a baseline on finances? My opinion would be yes. And could you have done it with the resources that you had available to you at the time? We were attempting to contract it out. We could not do it with contract the Contract it out. It had to be contracted out. And would that have been contracted out with the Library of Congress money, or would you have had to have sought an appropriation to do that, in your opinion? It would have been Library of Congress money. It would have been Library of yes. Congress money. Was there a dollar value associated with it? Did you get that far? Yes. The dollar value, we started out in 93. We estimated it to cost 100000 um, Then we upped it to the following year, I think it was 150000 and then now we went to 350, and then eventually th this year went to 750. And the reason being is that in order to go back and reconstruct opening balances, we felt that every year you delayed, it was just costing you that much more work. And that's why it was an escalation. The old stitch in time yes. argument. That's it. Finally, um, in your letter to the Rules Committee uh, that I'm privy to, you indicated that there was a degree of ignoring recommendations and audit findings on the part of library management, and you indicated that it could have saved um, dollars uh, had your recommendations uh, been followed. Do you have any specific examples that come to mind rather than a general statement? I don't have any specific statements, but I can tell you that for the period 91 through, I believe, 95, there was like 102 recommendations that were made, and as of As of October 1st, only 38 of them um, rem uh, still remained outstanding. So seven, the rest of them have been uh, taken care uh, of, but there were 38 outstanding recommendations. Still. Let me once again draw the analogy to the House of Representatives in terms of the audit findings and our attempt to carry out the recommendations. Uh, it has been very painful uh, to carry out the recommendations uh, of the auditors. Some of them um, uh, were uh, very difficult to comply with, but we have found uh, gritting our teeth and going forward and making the kinds of changes that had been recommended uh, produced significant positive uh, results. 
Had there been, have there been meetings? Uh, uh, what is the process of attempting to do a follow-up through the library management uh, of the IG's recommendations that have not been acted on some 90 some or more than actually yeah, around the 90 to 100? Okay, let me answer this question, that question this way. Sure. Suzanne Thorne, who's the Chief of Staff, has taken an active role in closing out a lot of these findings and recommendations. Matter of fact, on some of the ones we had on the financial side, she's basically helped us close them all out. So I would say right now there is, there is, change, there is movement to close out those old findings and recommendations because of our active support. And that probably they were prioritized and the most important ones were dealt with first, in your opinion, and so a number of them, although haven't been complied with, they are relatively less significant, in your opinion? I would think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, you've, uh, you've been involved in the IG uh, business for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you've seen recent changes mm -hmm. where there has been less of an adversarial relationship uh, with IGs internally, and that they've, they're being seen more and more as, pod, as positive management tools. And I'll, I'll close by drawing the analogy to the House of Representatives once again. I don't know how we could have done what we did in the time frame that we did it without having uh, the Inspector General working uh, with us, clearly at arm's length, not directly influenced by us, but as a partner in trying to solve a mutually agreed upon problem. And I think when all of the parties reach the position that it is a mutually agreed upon problem and that you can bring resources to the solution of that problem that are perhaps unique, that we might be able to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a follow-up question. Uh, a while ago when I asked you if you had any involvement in the proceedings now in the investigation of Detective Maceda, uh, you answered in the negative. Yes. Why haven't you been involved? Okay, the biggest reason was that um, Detective Maceda had come to my office uh, some time ago and she'd ma she made some allegations uh, and she asked for a legal opinion. I gave her a legal opinion regarding what she should do regarding her supervisors. Um, that later on turned out as to say that she said that I ignored her, her request for assistance. So therefore, I recluse myself from that and, until and give the sole responsibility for the investigation to Mr. Keeler. Thank you, Senator Pell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Riceberry. What would have happened if you had the statutory authority? What was the what action was the, that you did not take because you did not have it? What? would be, have been the difference in outcome if you'd had it? Well, the first difference I talked about was the fact that the criminal referrals that were that the police, well, the, let's say the allegation that the police had, criminal allegation, they would have been given to us. We would have referred them to the U.S. attorney. So we wouldn't have had this problem involving Mr. Holder saying, you know, with his understanding these things should have been referred. It's an automatic referral for an IG once we become aware of a criminal violation. So that would have been different. Um, there was also another audit that we did where we needed to get some information from an individual, and that individual left the library in employment, and there was nothing we could do after that. Um, we couldn't get any information regarding his involvement in the audit and some of the problems of that audit. So we could have had, a, if had, had we had authority, statutory authority, we could have gone out, we could have subpoenaed him, subpoenaed whatever records he had, we could have put him under oath and took testimony from him. We could not do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But Mr. Rensbarger, you knew of no federal violations. So whether you were statutory or not would have made no difference in relation to those uh, violations. No, we, if we'd been statutory, it would have had to come to us. See, the police in the library have statutory authority by virtue of the fact that they were established under law, and, um, which sets up the Library of Congress. We don't have such so We are an administratively established um, office. So they have the authority to take a criminal violation and report it to Superior Court. We cannot do that. They'll, and when we talked to the police chief, she basically, um, the day I introduced Ken to her, she basically said, well, why are you here? Because he had no statutory authority to be there. So statutory authority would have given us that power, and we could have demanded anything that she had be sent to us. Where was the information then blocked? It, was, it would be with the police. Where? It would have been with the police, not with us. Mr. Chairman, I think I can add to uh, uh, Mr. Rensbarger's statement. Uh, as Mr. Rensbarger mentioned, uh, when I came on board, we established the Office of Investigations within the IG's office in February of 95. 
one of my first priorities was to meet with the police chief and kind of establish some sort of relationship in terms of investigating criminal cases. She made it very clear to us on the very first day that she was not going to cooperate with us and flatly refused to share any criminal information with our office. She had a statutory basis for her existence and a requirement to investigate criminal cases. We at the time could only rely on uh, agency regulations that gave authority to the IG's office because we were non-statutory. Had we been statutory, we, uh, our statute, the IG statute, the obligation to report criminal information to the U.S. Attorney or to the Attorney General would have uh, overridden uh, perhaps or at least uh, the authority that the police had to investigate criminal cases or at the very uh, the, the worst case scenario would have been that we would have had concurrent jurisdiction for criminal investigations. But we had the same problem that the U.S. Attorney's Office had. Uh, they, the police, were not reporting criminal information to our office. Were they not reporting because they knew you weren't statutory? Well, sir, they, uh, that was part of how they explained it to us. I don't think they really knew what we were or, or what our function was, although we tried That's to explain it to them. That's my point. How many people have the full pedigree of one's origins and one's establishment, whether statutory or not? You hold that role of an, of an IG. I'm trying to get beyond this question of what you should be in the future and to find out what happened in the past. It sounds more and more like bureaucratic turf. If well, somebody knew of violations and didn't report it to you because you weren't statutory, surely you see those people in and out of the day. Surely there must be some camaraderie within the cafeteria or someplace else in the building. Absolutely not, sir. Not when it, ca not when it came to uh, establishing a relationship with the police department. They closed the door on us. When we examined our authority versus their authority, we found in law they had authority to investigate. And in law, they had no requirement to share information with us. The only way we could deal with that was to work to change our agency regulation to strengthen our investigative authority, and secondly, hope to get some sort of statutory authority from Congress. But the bottom line is you had no knowledge of any violation of federal law. Well, that's not true, sir. There were cases that that's we learned Mr. of. That's Rensbarger said a while ago. Well, there were, there were cases that we worked independent of the police where we learned of them independently. They weren't reported to us by the police. They were few and far between. And most of them were not, uh, well, none of them were prosecuted because they had no merit. These were, these were not major cases. These were minor uh, cases that became administrative. Mr. Rensbarger, do you want to amend your previous statement? No, the current regulations say if we are aware of a criminal violation, we report them to the general counsel of the library. And when there was a, if there has been a criminal case, we would have reported it to the general counsel. But you did indicate that you had no knowledge earlier when I asked the question oh, I, of that's, any federal that's violations. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Pastor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In reading the letter that you sent to Mr. McDermott, uh, you, add, you added an attachment to it. Yes. And so my questions will refer to that attachment. Uh, in there you have a general category, potential for compromise IG investigations. And one that stands out, at least to me, is criminal investigations have already been compromised. Would you elaborate on that and with some detail? Okay. I'll let Ken elaborate on that because he knows all the details more than I do. Thank you. Well, sir, uh, again, when, I be, when we established the Office of Investigations in February of 95, office space became an immediate concern and an immediate problem. There was no, the office space that was available to, the, to my office, the investigation section, uh, was not private and uh, didn't offer any sense of confidentiality to or assurance to any witnesses who were being interviewed by me. Uh, that was a significant problem. We tried uh, for several months to get some office space that was more private uh, where confidential sources could come to us, uh, but it took several months before that came about, before we were able to get some private office space from February to about uh, July of, of 95. 
uh, cases that were compromised. I had uh, financial services division people were on the other side of the wall from my office, and they came to me and explained that they were overhearing conversations that I was having with witnesses and that they could clearly hear what was being discussed. Uh, in the specific case that they mentioned, uh, caused me great concern because that was a potential criminal case. There weren't the elements of, of a criminal case in the beginning, but it was beginning to develop into a criminal case. Um, and uh, it, it concerned me that uh, information was leaking out through the walls uh, about this case and who I was interviewing and what they were saying. And we later learned that, that people uh, in the general population were hearing uh, what was being discussed in my office, and that caused me some great concern. So we had, we had some specific uh, potential compromises. You had lack of space, so therefore you couldn't properly uh, talk to a witness in which there was confidentiality, and you yes, wouldn't sir. compromise the witness. Witnesses were, we had cleaning people walking by waving to the witnesses, and we had uh, people just walk in while I was interviewing a witness and put something on my desk or, or ask me a question. Uh, those were unacceptable conditions for investigations, whether they be administrative or criminal. So, but you at least thought there was reason to believe there was criminal activity occurring. What did you do? Uh, did you just stop, or did you refer them to police, or oh, no, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what action did you take? The case that we worked that developed into a criminal case was referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, very quickly, very, very quickly. And uh, subsequently, the FBI uh, became involved in that case. Uh, I also heard, I, I think, when you were responding to a question, that the number of cases was minimal in, in terms of uh, your investigation. Uh, what number? Is it three, four, two, one, five? Well, sir, yet, uh, there's, we have to draw a distinction, I guess, between uh, administrative cases and criminal cases. Okay. Criminal cases were minimal because we weren't getting that kind of information. Administrative cases uh, were, were significant because there was a backlog of about 30 cases when I began and we took in another probably 30 cases between February and August of 95. So in terms of volume, we had about 60 cases during that time period. Um, Not knowing how you define criminal versus administrative, how, how would you define administrative, just for my knowledge? Well, a violation of, of uh, a criminal case would be a violation sure, I understand that. of any federal statute, federal, state, or local law. And an administrative uh, investigation could be an investigation of a, of a criminal matter that had been referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office for prosecution and declined and then pursued administratively, or it could be a violation of agency regulation, uh, which is non-criminal. So even though it's been denied for further investigation from the uh, U.S. Uh, but you, you still think there's enough merit to do it administratively? Yes, sir. You make that decision? Yes, sir. You could still pursue it aggressively. Have you found that there's been changes? I, I read also where there's been changes, additional personnel. Have you found the space now where you can conduct these uh, yes, sir. Uh, interviews? Yes, sir. We have adequate space now. So you think now that you'll be able to, you won't have your investigations compromised as you may have no, sir. alleged we, in the past? We feel comfortable where we are now. Just uh, also impairment to IJ audit uh, independence. And then you list a number of them, the, the trust fund audit, the financial statement audit, the National Library Services, overseas audit. Uh, do you care to elaborate a little bit more than what's, what's in, in, your, in your attachment? No, I like to think that what's here is adequate. Um, but let me, I can talk about one in particular involving the National Library Services for Blind and Physically Handicapped. There's an example of that operation had to fund its own audit that we were performing. Um, we were performing through a CPA firm. You're talking about the IG having to fund it. Right. Now, the, the director of that program, he wanted the right to approve the audit firm, the audit staff, and the audit program. And we had to explain to him several times that it's not done that way. We finally went to the service unit head and sat him down with the service unit head 
and we sort of got an understanding that he would let us do the audit the way it's supposed to be done. But yet, once on site, of course, which was off the library's campus, you know, every time an auditor would meet with one of his people, they were writing two sets of notes, one for them and one for him. You know, it was, it was, and then he would sit down with the audit staff and he would criticize the work that they were doing. So there was but he felt he had that right since he was funding the audit. And, and, and that's the problem of having independent. Independent means that we'd have our own funds, we'd do our own audits. Now, you may not curtail his activity, but you're certainly in a better position because you always have the threat that he may try to full, pull his funding. Now, were these financial audits or were they uh, assessment of uh, complying with the regulations of... Uh, it was, it was the a programmatic audit, looking programmatic at the entire audit. program. Yes, we were looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of that program. And the other two, do you have any comments on the other two? Well, the overseas audits, it's the same thing. Um, we don't have any money to travel, so if we want to do a look at the overseas audit, in the past, we've had to get the money from the overseas operations people. And in one case, there was a time when they suggested that we do a little bit more than what we had intended to do because they were funding the audit. Now, I'm assuming you had an input on the budget this year, as I read part of the material that uh, you, was new position. Do you uh, find that, you find some progress being made? I, progress has definitely been made. Um, I don't have Excuse any... Give me a minute, let me turn this off. There we go. No, I don't have any problem in things that have been done, you know, though we do have to go seek, I think for 96, some reprogramming. Uh, and once that's done, we'll have our budget. And then in 97, hopefully, we'll definitely have a line item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mack, would you yield at this point so that I could ask Senator Warner if he has any questions. Just have, uh, one quick one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, gentlemen and ladies, would you pull the mics up a little closer, because I think there's some people in the back having some difficulty hearing. Um, looking at your testimony, you use a word that interests me, and I want some expl explanation. <clears throat> I've been in <clears throat> the Inspector General Community Creation Sep. Prior to 78, I served in various audit positions with the Department of Defense and Labor. I'm aware of those conditions. That's the word I want to hear. I am aware of those conditions which prompted the Congress to pass the Inspector General's Act. It was the similarity of those pre-78 conditions to the conditions that I experienced at the Library of Congress while serving as its chief internal auditor from 83 to 88 that prompted me to request statutory authority for the Inspector General. Expand on what, what you mean by conditions. Those conditions I'm referring to are lack of resources, control of the audit organization through um, the budget. Um, and some agencies at one time, it was put under the Secretary, Assistant Secretary for Administration, which is the same person that they would audit. Um, like in my case, my budget and everything, that, everything we audited, the same people that reviewed our budget were the people that we were auditing. So that created a conflict for them. So those are the conditions I'm referring to. Those are the conditions. Those are the main conditions. There are other conditions, but those are the main right. ones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. <clears throat> Once again, trespassing on the generosity of Congress or of Senator Mack, I'd like to turn to Chairman Packard over here since he has a vote on, and perhaps he can get his questions in before the vote. Appreciate your consideration, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, the um, is the. Independent or the lack of independence of your uh, agency or you the IG with the library unique are there other federal very many federal agencies that have the same s setup that you do Prior to 88 the answer would have been yes After 88 I would say there may be some out there like the house of the legislative branch has its own IG which is non-statutory my understanding is that most of the IGs now are statutory, but there may be one or two agencies I'm not familiar with that may be non-statutory. And if you were independent, how would your budget be handled? My budget would be still go through the library's You'd be a line process, item. but the difference is if I have some strong objections to any modifications, I then have a recourse to the Congress to say, look, here's a problem. This is what I want to accomplish. I feel it's necessary. You know, I need the funds to be restored. In your testimony, you indicated that you did not receive uh, increase in staffing when requested during the, the years that you referred to. Uh, do you know whether other parts of the library also increased staff during that same period of time? Yes, there were other increases, yes. Mm -hmm. Were there decreases in other parts of the library in staffing? 
That's a tough question to answer. I can't answer that. I don't know that first. I just know there were some increases. I'm just trying to determine yeah. if, if, in fact, you were handled differently than other agent or departments within the Library mm -hmm. of Congress. Well, excuse me, sir. One of the problems I've had all along is not so much not having the staff. I mean, that was a serious problem. And one of the letters I have wrote where I was really upset at some of the, what was going on was that I just wasn't being given a hearing. Um, I'd have a group of people who would sit in, in judgment of my budget, and I didn't even, somehow I didn't even know who they were. I just knew they were people who worked for the library. So these people who I'm auditing are now sitting in judgment of my budget. And one time I was asked to come back and justify a figure and a budget that I didn't even submit because they had reduced it, and they said, I'll justify this. And I could not do that. And that was several years ago, and I wrote a blistering letter because I was very, very upset at it. What are, what are the, the elements of, of changing from a non-statutory um, uh, uh, to a statutory? What would need to be done? Well, first, it had to be legislation passed. It would require uh, legislation. It would require legislation, yes. Um, and I guess that, that's basically it, yes. Now to the heart of the problem. Uh, when did you first become aware of the mutilations and the thefts? I became aware of it at the time the Detective Maceda came to my office and was concerned about her reporting authority to her supervisors. She indicated there was some mutilation, and I said, well, bring me the evidence. You know, and the evidence never, never turned up. And the opinion was that you had to follow your supervisor's advice, but without evidence, I, wasn't, I couldn't act without the evidence. When, when was that? It was, it, was, it was December of 19, I want to say 94, but it could have been 93. It might have been 94. I just forget the exact date. I have a letter in my file that could tell me the date. That what did you do about the information when, it, when you finally received it? I sat down with the, um, with the letter that I was writing to him and said, I talked to the general counsel about the problem, but we weren't addressing the problem of the mutilation. We were addressing the problem of what does Maceda have to do? Because um, her question was, do I, have to, do I have to follow my supervisor's advice? You know, or I said, yes, because if you don't follow your supervisor's orders, then you'll be in, considered insubordinate. You know, and then we just, I just I waited to get the, any, any information she would have brought up to me. But, in your judgment, had you been independent, uh, as an independent IG, would you have received the information uh, sooner, and, what would, and would you have done it differently than what you did? Was the independent, non-independent uh, non an issue in, that, in, in the way it was handled? I don't think the independence was an issue at that point, in that issue. In the letter to the Rules Committee, you stated that uh, the library managers ignored uh, IG audit findings and recommendations that would save the library thousands of dollars. Can you be specific on some of that? No, I can't be specific because we're talking approximately 30, there was 102 recommendations from 91 to October 1 of this year, and there were 38 that were still outstanding. And so I, I don't know all 38 of them. Could you provide we that? We could provide you. A we have provided a list of management, and they're taking care of them now. I think that'll be satisfactory for the time being, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman Packer. Don't Thank miss you. your vote. <laughs> Senator Mack, thanks again for your, your patience. No, I understand the situation. And I, and I, th there are several areas that, uh, that I want to uh, pursue uh, which, frankly, have already been touched on, but I want to ask the questions, I guess, from my perspective. Um, the, the issue here with respect to security, as I understand it, is that when there are criminal investigations um, at the Library of Congress, there is a report that's supposed to be made to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Is it, uh, is it your opinion that the, uh, the, po that the police of the Library of Congress are required to make that report? Or uh, let, me, let me add an addendum to it then. If not the police, then who is required to make the report? Uh, Senator Mack, I perhaps could answer that question more accurately. Um, 
The police, uh, by law, have a, any federal law, any law enforcement person has a duty to report to a prosecutive body a violation of law. And, uh, by statute, uh, the police in the Library of Congress have that requirement. Uh, we, even though we're non-statutory as an IG, we certainly adopt the same policy, and we have since the Office of Investigations was established in February of 95. Um, since prior to August 3rd, prior to uh, the, some revelations about the security collection, theft, and mutilation, uh, prior to August 3rd of 95, uh, the police uh, had the primary responsibility for doing that, although we, whenever we had any criminal case, we, we made that referral independent of the police to the U.S. Attorney's Office. After August 3rd, by Dr. Billington's direction and, and order to the police, uh, we in the IG's office had the exclusive authority to make re criminal referrals to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and he took that authority away from the police. So, okay, so the answer is that prior to August the 3rd, uh, it's your opinion that the police of the Library of Congress had the requirement to make that report to the U.S. Attorney's Office? Yes, they did. Um, I believe there's also a letter from the U.S. Attorney that uh, uh, outlines uh, the concerns of the U.S. Attorney's Office as to what had not been done. I mean, is, isn't that where this all kind of got started? That uh, Yes, sir. Could, could uh, any of you kind of lay out for me uh, the concerns that were raised? And um, I understand that you all did an investigation of why uh, these reports weren't made, and could you provide me with uh, some information with respect to your findings of, of that investigation? Yes, sir, I can. The disagreements between the police department and the U.S. Attorney's Office dates back, date back to November of 92. Uh, it was at that time that uh, J. Marshall Jarrett uh, from the U.S. Attorney's Office, a senior official from the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, wrote a letter to the library, and he made essentially two requests. One, that all criminal cases be referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office at the U.S. District Court level. For, for prosecutorial consideration. And secondly, that all criminal information be referred to the FBI as well, concurrently. Okay, now let me stop you right here. That was a request made by the U.S. Attorney's Office? Yes, sir, that was a request. Was there an agreement with the library as to how that would be handled? Well, subsequently, uh, there was uh, a meeting took place after a second letter. There wasn't an initial response from the library to that letter. Uh, there wasn't a response until the second letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office arrived in February of the following year, February of 93. And at that time, the same individual, J. Marsha Jarrett, said, essentially, uh, I wrote this first letter asking about uh, why the library is, is not referring cases to the U.S. Attorney's office, office at the U.S. District Court level and why the library is not uh, heeding our request to report criminal information to the FBI. And you've you haven't yet responded to me. Um, this was in February. Uh, subsequently, the library, the, the general counsel at the library, responded uh, to that letter and uh, addressed some of the issues that were raised and suggested that a meeting take place between police officials at the library and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And that meeting took place on March 31st of, of 93. And subsequent to that meeting, uh, Carol Fortine, an assistant U.S. attorney who was at that meeting, uh, wrote a letter to uh, the Director of Protective Services at the Library of Congress who managed the police department. And in that letter, uh, she alluded to issues that were discussed. And the, the two issues of primary concern that she mentioned was referral of all criminal information to the U.S. Attorney's Office at the U.S. District Court level as opposed to the superior court level. And secondly, that all criminal information be referred to the FBI for entry into their database. She, Carol Fortine, considered that letter uh, an agreement. Uh, she made reference in closing, in her closing in that letter, she, she mentioned that if uh, the Chief of Protective Services or any other library official had any disagreements with uh, her request that they should communicate those disagreements uh, to her. Otherwise, they would assume that uh, they agreed with 
what was requested. So the U.S. Attorney's Office considered that uh, that letter, which memorialized issues discussed in the March 31st meeting, to be in agreement with the Library of Congress police. Uh, was there a letter, or were there a series of letters disagreeing with? Uh... No, sir. There was, so there was no correspondence. Uh, from the library. Do you know whether the library has ever taken the position that they, in fact, didn't agree to that? Yes, sir. Can you tell me about that? Uh, I, th I think that in a response from the general counsel's letter in uh, February of 93, uh, the general counsel, to some ex to a limited extent, defended uh, the practice uh, by the police, by the library police, to refer cases, criminal cases, to the D.C. Superior Court uh, where they were prosecuted under D.C. Code as opposed to being referred to the U.S. District Court and being prosecuted under Title 18 or under federal statute. Um, he, in reading that letter, one comes away with a sense that he was supporting the police, that practice. Um, and, and also, and, and to when, a limited extent, um, suggested that, that there was a misunderstanding uh, that the Justice Department had about the types of cases that are generated by the library, um, speaking specifically about theft and mutilation of books and so collection from, materials. So from the library's perspective, there was no agreement? Exactly, sir. And when was that letter written? Uh, the letter was written uh, April 5th, 93, memorializing the March 31st, 93 meeting between library police officials and, and a representative of the U.S. Okay. Attorney's Office. I I'm getting a little bit confused. Um, I, I, I asked you if there was, um, uh, did the library take the position that there was no agreement? And I think you referred to a letter uh, that someone from the library wrote. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Yes, that was the, re the initial, the, the only response from the library was a response that, that I'm aware of. The only response was in February of 93 to J. Marshall Jarrett of the U.S. Attorney's Office. That was responding to his November of 92 letter and also his later February of 93 letter. And in that letter, the general counsel, as I explained, uh, uh, defended to a limited extent the practice of, of the police department. Now, subsequent to that, there, there's no communication that I know of, it, with the exception of the agency's response to the Eric Holder letter of June 13, 95. Um, in July of 95, the agency responded uh, to Eric Holder's letter to Dr. Billington of June yeah, but let, let me, I, I want to make sure I understand this right, because I, I, I think one of the premises that I was operating under was that there was an agreement between the U.S. Attorney's Office and the library. And what you're telling me now is that um, the library in February of 1993, responding to maybe a, a couple or a series of letters, in essence took, uh, 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 disagreed with that. Yes, sir. Was, that the, was there a follow-up letter then that came from the U.S. Attorney's Office restating uh, what they thought the position ought to be or how the Yes, sir, there was. On May 12th of 95, mm -hmm. uh, there was but a... But it, it went from February of 93 to May of 1995? Yes, and the, the information that we developed suggested that the, the U.S. Attorney's Office wasn't, wasn't aware that, the, that library officials had any problem with, their, with the April 5th letter that they considered uh, an agreement. This, this gets a little complicated, but uh, because there was no correspondence coming back from the library to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office just assumed that from April of 93 to May of 95 that there was no problem and that the police were reporting criminal information to the U.S. Attorney's Office and to the FBI. They didn't learn until May of 95 through, by accident that that wasn't happening. Okay. Let me, uh, Senator Pell has asked me to uh, yield to him for a moment. Senator, you know, one minute. I have to go to an appointment with the minority leader. Uh, if the hearing goes on into the afternoon, I'd be glad to be here. Just one second. But again, I, 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 up until, let's say, uh, the, then beginning again in May of 1995, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, in essence, 
began this uh, yes, sir, discussion please. again. Uh, what happened after that? Uh, after this letter in 1995? Um, the the letter was directed to the, the director or the chief of protective services and it explained once again their frustration uh, with the library not following their requests. Um, the evidence suggests that uh, the chief of protective services uh, consulted with general counsel uh, in, in order to respond appropriately to that letter of May 12th, which restated, of course, their the Justice Department's demands once again. Um, and uh, that letter apparently was never sent. Uh, there's, there's no record of it now ever being sent because... Now, which letter? Are we talking about a response from the library? This is a response back the from the library to the, to the Justice Department. It wasn't... It, apparently, it took several weeks for the library to, to kind of work through a response. And meanwhile, the Eric Holder letter of June 13, 1995 arrived at the library and that sort of superseded their need to respond to that letter from the prosecutor. Yeah. I, I th uh, make a statement. Sir. Okay. Um, I mean, you don't have any problem. I mean, again, I'm not addressing the issue of the substance at this point, but you don't have any problem uh, with uh, the conclusion that I just drew that during this period well, of time that they had not agreed with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, oh, sir, I don't know that I have a problem with it. I, I think it's a matter of semantics. I don't think that there, I mean, in examining all, all of the correspondence from the U.S. Attorney's Office to the Library of Congress, in examining all this, the issues that they cite and, and the language that they use in, in their request of, of the library, um, I think one could, could make a valid argument that there was no agreement. What there was was a request from the U.S. Attorney's Office for cooperation. So I don't, we didn't find any, a violation of an agreement per se. What we did find was a sense of arrogance, a sense of ignorance on the part of the police uh, in not dealing with a very significant uh, problem with a prosecutorial body, uh, particularly since Eric Holder administers both the D.C. Superior Court as well as the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia. So if he asked that a case be referred at the district court level, that's where it should be referred. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I have several other questions. Do you mind me just continuing on? Or? Senator Mack, continue on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you sir. Let, me, uh, let me suggest. I mean, I won't make this uh, an all-day affair, but I do. Well, I, let me suggest I'm hoping that we can finish with the last panel, on the CFC panel, uh, before noon. Okay. All right. I'll, it's I'll very try. brief. It is, I believe. Okay. And then reconvene at 2.30 to hear Dr. Billington. Okay. If right. that I, fits I will, your schedule. Yeah, I, I will do whatever you want. I, I don't want to rush you. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate but, it. But you might hurry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it might be helpful to get on the record kind of what the substance of the, of the, of the disagreement, though, is about as to what, what, what is, I mean, I must say uh, for a layman, the the differences that you pointed out, I don't understand them. I mean, uh, so it might be helpful for us to understand why it's significant uh, that the U.S. Attorney made the request uh, the way uh, that, uh, that, uh, that they did. What is, what is gained by taking the approach uh, that the U.S. Attorney has requested as opposed to the approach that the library uh, took? And, and again, I guess I'm giving you an opportunity to kind of Mm -hmm. Explain what you mean by arrogance and, and, and mm -hmm. the other uh, adjectives that you used. Do you, yes. do you want me to respond to that? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I, I think the, uh, uh, the basis for the, for, for the request uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office was because they viewed uh, theft and mutilation of collection material at the library uh, to be a federal property offense and as such should be referred for prosecution under federal law, Title 18. Um, and they wanted to play a significant role in the prosecution of theft and mutilation at the library. Uh, so that was really the, 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 the primary reason for the U.S. Attorney's Office wanting prosecution under federal law. Penalties are, are typically stiffer under federal law. Um, and uh, I think they felt that that was the arena that that these investigations should be in. 
uh, under the Superior Court, referrals to the Superior Court are prosecuted under the D.C. Code, uh, where penalties may not be as severe as, as under federal law. And the, uh, and the U.S. Attorney's Office just wanted more control over, over these prosecutions. They wanted them to be bumped up to a higher level of visibility so that they could get more, more personal attention by senior justice officials. All right. I, I, I think, uh, again, because of time, I think I will let this uh, end at that point. And uh, I do want to get into some of the discussions now about uh, uh, the audits. Um, Mr. Rensbarger, you, you might help me. Um, um, you heard my uh, discussion, my questions of uh, GAO earlier with respect to uh, uh, the necessity for a quicker response and so mm -hmm. forth. I, I am under the impression from having read some of your, um, uh, some of the material given to me with respect to your request for uh, uh, dollars for work to be done, uh, that you had an opinion that uh, maybe is close to mine that uh, a, a, a uh, quicker response uh, to the uh, recommendations made by the General Accounting Office uh, should have occurred. I wonder if you would tell us, uh, from your perspective, after reviewing uh, the GAA, GAO uh, audit and its recommendations, what did you think the Library of the Congress should have been doing at that point? And what did they fail to do? Okay, what I felt they should have been doing was trying to get their fiscal house in order. And to the extent that they went out and procured or purchased a financial system, I think that was correct. What my concern was, and the reason why I requested the audit in 90, well, it was, in the, it was 1991, but it was for fiscal 93. So what we're talking about was do, looking at the, the work five years after this last statement audit. And the purpose, again, as I indicated once before, was I was concerned about the balances. I knew how much it cost us to bring those balances up to date. And, uh, and I also was uh, concerned about having somebody go in and give us some type of benchmark as to where we were, you know, five years after the last audit had been done. So that's what I was trying to do, to use it as a yardstick for saying, yes, we're making progress, or no, we're not making progress, but at least we'll know where we're going. Um, and so that's, where, that's my direction. So that's why every year I was requesting money for, for audits. So in these, in these requests, and, and again, there, is one of, there are several of them here specifically uh, asking for, I think, I'll get, uh, let me get to the year here. The first one was in calendar year 91. It was in the 90, request, it's fiscal 93 budget. Yeah, May 28, 1991. You made a request, I think, of $100,000. Yes. Uh, and that was to, in essence, bring the 1988 figures current so that yes. that would be the base upon which an audit could be done. Correct. Uh, and you made a, an additional request for money in the following year, I think, of $150,000. Right, up until 95. I didn't do it in 95 because I didn't receive a budget call. Now, what is the significance of not receiving a budget call? A budget call is just a, a memo that comes out from the um, Financial Services Directorate saying that, you know, please submit your budget by a certain date, um, and they give you pr parameters under which you should submit a budget, like level funding, um, put down your estimated growing workload. Um, they'll say, don't worry about furniture and fixtures, because that's going to be handled later, things like that. It's the guidelines that which you use to put your budget together. Uh, how did you take it, though? I mean, was this, uh, did, was there some, was there some, conclusion that you drew from the fact that you weren't being asked now that you've... In all honesty, the fact that I didn't receive it went completely unnoticed for a long time. Um, when I finally got a request for furniture and fixtures, they said, um, and I said, where was the rest of the budget call? And they said, well, you weren't getting any this year because we had decided we weren't going to increase the workload um, within the librarian's office. And by then it was a little too late. But there were so many things going on, it just, just slipped through the cracks. Um, why don't you detail for me, if you can, um, your efforts to communicate with the library's management uh, the need for follow-up audits uh, to the GAO audit and the need uh, for resources to conduct them. Did you have any discussions or was this strictly by the... It was strictly through the budget process because uh, putting the money in, I wanted the money requested through the budget. We're not, we weren't talking 
uh, actual resources in terms of adding people. What we're talking about was hiring a CPA firm to come in and do the work. So I was doing it through the budget process, and I put my justification in the budget process saying, I need this money to hire a CPA firm to do this. Then did you draw any conclusions about the attitude of management with respect to, the, uh, to these requests? <clears throat> IGs tend to draw negative attitudes. Okay, you know, I'm, we, I'm we, we draw negative conclusions on just about anything, which is probably not fair to management. I was definitely concerned about the budgetary treatment of our office, and I know I'm going beyond what you're talking about there. And I've expressed that in several memos um, where I indicated that I felt that we were you know, sort of being mistreated, sort of being like the, the stepchild. Um, so I did never express maybe an opinion on that particular issue per se, except to put it in the budget. But I, was, I had requested or I had indicated I was dissatisfied with the overall treatment of our office from a budgetary standpoint. Okay, so, so it would be unfair for someone to uh, conclude that you drew the conclusion um, that management took the position that they didn't want these done because they didn't fund them? I think that would be, um, could be overreaching. I would have to put myself in the place of management and in some of the budget meetings, which I wasn't there, so I could not say that. It would be fair. To, wouldn't that be fair? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please, Senator. Uh, uh, we're going to sit with you throughout whatever time you require. Uh, we've had a, a little change here of time frame. I'm going to ask the next panel to come now, Computer Sciences Corporation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rinsbarger and Mr. Keeler. We hope that you will be able to remain uh, throughout the testimony if questions arise in Ms. Scala uh, <coughs> later that we may refer back to you if that's convenient. and then. We will hear the next panel and then recess for the noon hour until 2 o'clock instead of 2.30, for at which time uh, Dr. Billington will be testifying. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we will hear testimony from Computer Sciences Corporation. The Library of Congress contracted with CSC to perform a two-day security evaluation of the library. CSC was recommended to the library by the Department of Defense. A report has been presented to the Librarian of Congress, and it is my understanding that CSC's recommendations are in the process of being implemented. The Library of Congress chose to contract CSC to perform a six-month security review, which began in early October. That was following the two-day walkthrough. CSC is here today to share with us the results of that two-day review and explain the scope of their latest contract. Representing CSC is Mr. Robert R. Featherington, Operations Director, and Mr. Michael J. Kenney, Senior Program Manager. Gentlemen, we welcome and thank you for taking the time to share with us your testimony. We will have your entire printed statement placed in the record, and you may proceed either to summarize or highlight or read whatever you prefer to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee, good morning. I'm Bob Featheringham. I'm the Operations Director at Computer Sciences. Uh, I work in the Systems Engineering Division. Uh, Computer Sciences Corporation is the largest uh, independent information technology services company in the world. We have annual revenues of $3.6 billion. Would you kindly of add your connection to the state of Virginia, please? And we're... Uh, <laughs> We're proud occupiers of the state of Virginia, although our, our corporate headquarters are in El Segundo, California. Thank we you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm we the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> we got something in Bartlett going uh, or not? <laughs> and, I, and we're losing control, sir. Uh, we provide clients with a wide range of professional uh, services, including management consulting, business reengineering, information uh, systems consulting and integration, and outsourcing. For nearly 15 years, CSC has provided physical security consulting services to a variety of federal government agencies, including the military services, the National Security Agency, 
uh, Central Intelligence Agency, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Justice. Um, as you just stated, uh, we were uh, uh, called in uh, by the, uh, the, the library uh, to uh, help them uh, take a look at uh, their security issues. Uh, consequently, they placed us under contract to provide security consulting assistance. And uh, we brought Mr. Mike Kenny here, who's my program manager and is actually doing the, uh, work for the consulting work for the library, and he will read our testimony. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good morning. Uh, I am Mike Kenny, Senior Program Manager of Computer Sciences Corporation's Security Engineering Operations Directorate. On behalf of CSC, I am pleased to be here and appreciate the opportunity to share CSC's views on physical security, especially as they relate to the current developments at the Library of Congress. In the interest of brevity, I will summarize our statement. Computer Sciences Corporation has long been a provider of the fully integrated approach to its clients' physical security problems. In our view, an effective physical security program involves the prudent use of policies and procedures, personnel, and physical security equipment backed by a security strategy or approach which supports the security goals of the client's organization. This integrated methodology forms the cornerstone of CSC's technical approach to physical security. When first approached by the Library of Congress on or about August 9th, library officials were fully briefed regarding this methodology. At the time of this initial contact, however, it was clear that the library was seeking a more preliminary and shorter term effort. It was made clear prior to the commencement of work and again in the final report that findings based on such a short observation period would only represent a sampling of the data on which a sound security program should be based. CSC strongly recommended that a more thorough survey of the library be conducted to, form, to more fully characterize the environment and its problem areas. The assessment was conducted during a two-day visit on August 15th and 16th, 1995 by a five-person team. As a result of that initial assessment, CSC made the following significant findings. There is no director of security, rather a protective services officer who reports to the director integrated support services has a security responsibility. A plan for enhancing collections security was completed by the library in 1993 and revised in 1994. The plan, while a good beginning, does not pull the initiatives that are mentioned in the plan together into a cohesive security program. There, were no, there was no baseline loss or condition data that existed for the general collection. Rules and regulations in the areas of stack access and movement within the stack area are not widely or systematically followed or inspected or enforced. Covert surveillance had been initiated into the stack area, was conducted where suspicious activity uh, had been identified. Our recommendations included the following, that a permanent director of security be assigned and report directly to the librarian, that a forceful security policy statement emphasizing the protection security responsibility be issued, that the library begin the development of a security awareness or education program, and that in writing, the librarian makes security a responsibility of each service unit head, and that he hold them accountable for that security responsibility. We also recommended that the library install mock closed circuit television cameras as a deterrent. We recommended that the library initiate the use of random mock. mock, yes sir initiate the use of random covert CCTV surveillance in the general stack areas. And we recommended that the library continue with the reduction of authorized access to the general stack areas. Since the conclusion of this initial security review, the library has responded with initiatives aimed at improving its security posture. For example, in August, the librarian issued a major statement regarding security responsibilities. Additionally, a security hotline was established. Locks on caged areas within the stack area have been upgraded or are in the process of being upgraded, and a follow-on contract regarding a comprehensive security survey was in fact issued. 
The security responsibility facing the Library of Congress is a daunting one. Over 100 million items require protection. That security responsibility is made even more complex by the library's other responsibility to make its collection available. A balance must be struck between the conflicting requirements of availability and security. The attainment of that proper balance requires the, that a judgment be made regarding how much or how little access is acceptable in order to create the availability that's deemed appropriate. The conclusion in our two-day assessment report submitted in August stated that the theft and mutilation problem had been evolving since the establishment of the library and could not be solved overnight. We are even more convinced of the truth of that statement today. The library needs to establish or identify the full breadth and depth of its security problems. It then needs to establish realistic security objectives based on its dual missions, availability and security. And a security strategy to broadly address how much risk is acceptable must be put into place. Once in place, development and implementation of a fully integrated security program can be undertaken. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the opportunity to share our views, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, gentlemen, for your succinct analysis. If you would do uh, for me uh, a, a review again of, this, of the new contract, the, the six months contract that began in October, would you spell out in a little more detail what you expect to cover in that particular review and uh, some of the objectives that were built upon your two-day uh, review? There are four tasks that are a part of the new contract. The first task is to conduct a comprehensive security survey of the library's major facilities. Those facilities include the Landover Center Annex, its loading dock areas, as well as the Jefferson, Madison, and Adams buildings. That's the first task. The second task is to assess police operations as they relate to collection security. The third task is to conduct a, excuse me, the third task is to work with the library to build a security awareness and education program. And the fourth task is to conduct an inventory and a condition check of a selected portion of the library's holdings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, familiar with the corporation, I have Edwards Air Force Base in my district, and there are a number of security concerns at Edwards Air Force Base. And going back a number of years in terms of the secrecy that goes on there, and we've done a pretty good job of keeping the lid on a number of items. I didn't hear clearly in your testimony, uh, Mr. Kenny, either a differentiation or a focus on for want of a better term, the internal versus the external threat. Um, could you comment on that? We are examining... Especially in terms of the, of the provisions that you indicated should be put in place, and would they be principally directed toward an external threat of theft or internal or both, and how do you put an emphasis on internal versus external? When we first were approached by the library, uh, the threat was not specifically identified to us as an insider threat or an outsider threat. Obviously, there is a dual threat. Our conclusion prior to the conduct of the two-day survey was that the greatest threat rested with the insider threat. Uh, that decision was based on two factors, basically. One, uh, that the library had identified to us the possibility that uh, theft or mutilation had occurred. Uh, and based on our knowledge of the fact that the library had reduced or eliminated public access to the general stack area uh, two years earlier, uh, that led us to conclude that the threat, at least to the general stack area, uh, probably the greatest threat rest rested with the uh, internal threat. The current study uh, calls for us really to make some differentiations. Uh, as an example, at the Landover Center Annex, uh, our view is that the threat is roughly equal. Uh, 
Uh, although perhaps if I were to ask which is the greatest, uh, I would probably also say that it's, it's the insider threat. Uh, in the loading dock area, for example, depending on the efficacy or the effectiveness with which guards are enforcing access from the loading dock area, the street side of the loading docks, uh, the threat there perhaps is, is equal both from the insider and the outsider. Uh, when we get into the uh, Adams building, the Jefferson building, and the Madison building, I think again we would be looking more toward the insider threat. But again, we will not eliminate the possibility of an outsider threat. We have reading rooms, and those people that would use those reading rooms would be considered outsiders. And, and when you place, and I guess it would be fair to say that what you've done is probably tipped the scale slightly more toward an internal threat rather than an external threat, although differentiating in various locations. That's correct, sir. Um, one of the things that I've noticed internationally in terms of priceless items and the rest is that to a very great extent now, uh, almost immediate and widespread exposure of the loss, although perhaps embarrassing, uh, is perhaps one of the greatest ways to, to deal with it. And uh, the old business of swift and sure justice, swift and sure publicity tends to dry up potential markets for these kinds of items. Did you assess the ability to um, expose losses? Uh, first of all, you have to know that, that you suffered them to be able to do it. But was part of your security examination whether or not there was an ability to provide an alert or a response or a communication to the outside world, to those folks who tend to deal in either the antiquities or the kinds of things that might have been stolen, would you consider that part of a security structure uh, or not? I would consider it part of a security uh, structure in the sense that it is, would be an appropriate response. With the two-day study, there was not the time uh, to really consider that particular aspect. I think the focus was on a number of other areas. Do you think it would be appropriate then to examine our ability to get up on whatever communication structures there are to the appropriate authorities? Uh, but also, I'm sure that there are groups of people, and I'm not as knowledgeable I, as I guess I should be in the area, who uh, are well aware of um, items that have been stolen from other museums or other types of things, where you have, I guess, a limited market for some of this stuff that has a potential value. Or did you find the things that were being stolen tended to be of a nature in which folks would not try to get some kind of a financial gain from them, but rather they were coveted for what they were. And I guess if it's an insider problem, that might be more a, a, of a problem because they simply want them. Well, I think there are, there are uh, several responses to your comments. Uh, first, uh, I would consider, again, that uh, notification to the appropriate authorities would be an appropriate response for the library to take. Now, whether you call that a reactive or security response, uh, that's a semantical distinction. Uh, secondly, we did not, as part of the two-day study, take a look at the items that were stolen. So I can't comment on uh, the viability of the items that were stolen or uh, how, uh, how much interest they would draw to uh, potential um, people uh, involved in that market. Um. Well, I guess I'm going to be pursuing that direction as we look at the question of security because clearly from a management point of view and esprit de corps and a reviewing of the rules, I know all, all of us were concerned, especially in terms of the Korean conflict, what occurred with prisoners of war and the efforts to get people to understand what they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be doing it. And that I think this is an excellent example of something that could be done from a management point of view. but. I'll be looking at whether or not we... Uh, I guess my, my problem is that I don't think we ought to spend a whole lot of money reviewing exactly what we have, as I said earlier, placing a value on it, uh, and then worrying about uh, security. I want to make sure we have, if you will, the best padlocks available, uh, which I think is a significant way to deal with the external threat, but then from the internal uh, threat, work on an understanding of what people are doing and how they're doing it. And I hope that that will be a direction uh, that's taken rather than just the usual um, 
surveillance and security kinds of approaches because I think in the long run, uh, clearly to me, unless I'm convinced otherwise, the greatest threat to the security of the collection was, is, and will be an internal one. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to <coughs> take note that we are holding this hearing in the Senate Rules Committee, and that's under the gracious hosting of Senator John Warner of Virginia. I also want to indicate that the Joint Committee on the Library is made up of members of the House Administration and the Senate Rules Committee. <coughs> House Oversight Committee, I guess the new name, <laughs> trying to retrain me to talk about the Ballast Budget Act instead of reconciliation. <laughs> uh, I want to also indicate that Senator Warner, as the chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, on alter alter alternating between the House and the Senate chairmanship for this committee, uh, could have taken the chairmanship very easily as the chairman of the Rules Committee. But in keeping with his gracious nature and his generosity, he, uh, he uh, let me take the chairmanship as the next ranking person on the committee. And so I not only want to thank him for letting us be hosted here, but also for letting me be chairman of this joint committee. Senator Warner. Well, and thank you, uh, Senator Hatfield. But it is clear to all of us in the United States Senate that you have been sort of the father figure of the Library of Congress throughout your long and distinguished career in the United States Senate. And it's most appropriate that, that you chair this hearing together with our distinguished colleague, Mr. Thomas, from the House. And this is a very important hearing. The Library of Congress is cherished and beloved all across this great land. It ranks with the comparable institutions in the great nations of the world. I one time, I think, perhaps ill-advisedly, said we ought to change the name from the Library of Congress, Congress not being one of the more popular institutions, the Library of the United States, but that has not gotten off the ground. That rocket failed. <laughs> and I want to make sure that there's a positive note as comes out of this hearing. Yes, we have a problem. We're going to address it under the leadership of our competent chairman and co-chairman here, and indeed our valued colleague from the Appropriations Committee and others. But my point is as follows. In our preparations with your firm and the work that you were done, there were some discussions, and I haven't heard it today, and it may well be, Mr. Chairman, that we have to go back and ask for a supplemental study. But we need to run some comparison with other libraries in the United States and the problems that they are experiencing. Uh, just a personal note, when I was in law school, I worked my way through part-time by working in the law library. I hasten to point out it was $1.25 an hour, which was adequate in those days to do a lot. But I loved it, and I knew the Dewey Successful System, I think I could still work at it. But my point is, I have studied the libraries in my state and indeed the public libraries in the nation's capital, and they are suffering comparable problems. So let us make certain that the message that goes forth today is while we do have our problems in this cherished institution known as the Library of Congress, founded in many respects by the distinguished Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, uh, there are commensurate problems across America. What can you tell us today thus far in your work about comparable problems with comparable institutions elsewhere in the United States. And I close, uh, I say to my good friend Mr. Thomas, the word padlock, I, I shuddered a bit because I've used the Library of Congress ever since I was a student many years ago. And I, th the freedom of access contributed to the learning process that I experienced. And we do, it's a public library, it is the nation's public library. Those books aren't owned by the Congress. They're owned by each and every citizen of this nation. And therefore, I know we have to work on security, but let us hope that access, freedom of access, does remain somehow a message that goes forth from this great institution. Chairman, yes, yes. And, uh, I, I accept uh, that comment because by 
using padlock, I meant security and not yes, barring I'm sure people from getting in. Yeah. I'm trying to think of another term, and I'd appreciate yeah. well, help. I, I thought of electric wire, but that wasn't a good one. Either. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, a gentleman, uh, once again, uh, uh, to the core of my inquiry, what experiences have comparable institutions have? And if not, would you, uh, subject to the chair's concurrence, uh, consider perhaps going back and re-examining that? We need a baseline to study from. I, I can't give you a comparable experience base. Uh, what we are doing as part of our uh, survey and part of our, our entire job is we have uh, contacted the American Society of Industrial Security. Uh, we have uh, asked that society to provide us with a list of names of security professionals who are involved in the security efforts surrounding a number of libraries and museums. We have identified s seven to ten individuals thus far, and we are in the process of talking to them. I think that I could uh, summarize the comment uh, uh, of our findings with them by saying that at this point, most of those security professionals uh, understand the need for access that you just uh, so eloquently mentioned. And that really complicates the security problem, as I mentioned as in our opening statement. The difficulty that you have with this type of a security job is balancing the requirement for service and access with security. And trying to find that proper balance is indeed a very difficult one. Uh, the access and the balance question or the service question can be achieved in a number of ways short of padlocks. Uh, limiting access, providing additional people for service, because ultimately a, sur a security program is really uh, best served by what we would call the upfront people, the clerks, the people who are in dealing with the public, uh, who are in a position not only to provide service, but are also in a position to provide security, because they are your frontline eyes and ears, just as a soldier in a foxhole is the frontline eyes well, and ears I, for the I, commander. I, let's turn to the other question, though. Well, what, did you talk to the New York Library? Uh, I don't have the listing of names with me, Senator. We've talked to... Uh, but are they not experiencing comparable problems across America? They are experiencing problems. Whether or not I'd call them comparable at this point, I don't have enough information. Well, to... I would hope, Mr. Chairman, we could get uh, that information and include it in this record, either with the uh, services of CSCE or... And, dear, I'm, I'm certain that uh, our witness, Mr. Billington, the distinguished the librarian, because he and I have discussed this problem in detail, can, can uh, provide some information on that. But I think it's important that we not send a signal that this is just a government institution and consequently it is not performing properly. We are. There's dedicated servants there. They're doing the best they can uh, from the library and on down. But we got a problem. But it's the same problem in many respects being experienced by the small town libraries in my state. We can make the comparison, sir. To some extent. I'm not suggesting that it's any worse in Virginia than elsewhere. We can make the comparison that what we're finding up to this point is not unique. Uh, there, there are similar problems in a number of institutions. We've found them with the New York City Transit Authority, for example. Uh, so uh, there are a number of problems uh, that, that exist that are common. And I think you would find that regardless of where you look. Well, it's a challenge, and it's one we have to face up to and hopefully succeed in, uh, in working it better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank again, you. I commend you for holding this hearing. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Pastor. Mr. Chairman, knowing that uh, your schedule requires you to uh, leave uh, by 12, uh, I'll, sip, I'll submit my questions written for him. Thank you. Senator Mack that, I really feel badly about raising, <laughs> raising any questions. Um, uh, uh, maybe just a couple of brief ones. And then we'll, then we'll... I guess the, the first question I would ask you is, give me a sense again of the, uh, um, your impression of the security plan at the library when you first uh, uh, reviewed it. The security plan is essentially a listing of problems that the library has identified. So from our perspective as security professionals, I'm not sure that I would call it a plan. I would call it a collection of uh, 
shortcomings or security shortcomings that have been identified. Uh, the library uh, clearly uh, did a very good job, I think, in identifying those problems. As I mentioned in our statement, uh, what is lacking here is bringing those findings together and the development from those findings into a comprehensive security plan. Yeah. Can you tell me when uh, those findings were determined? Well, as I mentioned, the, the uh, plan was, I think, first drawn up in 1993 and revised in 1994. The performance uh, or the period of time that it took them to arrive at its initial draft in 1993, I'm not sure of. Mm -hmm. But I, and I guess the, 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 your underlying point is that while there has been an identification of the problems with respect to security, that there really was not follow-up, though, in putting in place the kinds of procedures, the necessary equipment, uh, and the, I guess, auditing of that uh, that would make um, uh, for a proper security plan. I think that the answer to that question is uh, is, is a bit of disagreement. Uh, they did follow up on several of the uh, areas that they found in the plan. Uh, as an example, I think the plan identified the fact that they had a problem uh, with respect to access out at Landover Center Annex, and they have taken action on that. Uh, what I mean by the fact that they have not developed a comprehensive security plan is to step back from the 47 items that they found take a look in, in our analysis of those 47 items and say, what does this really indicate generically? And then how do we best approach that generically from an integrated security approach? Do we, do we apply strictly equipment or electronics to the problem? Do we apply a combination of electronics, policy, procedures? Uh, if it's strictly electronics, what type of electronics do we apply? That's, that's what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. So I think that they missed the, the, the next step, which is to step back, analyze what this is telling you, and then develop a plan to attack it. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, last question I would have, uh, and, and maybe this uh, has nothing to do with your particular area. Earlier we had a discussion with uh, the folks from the IG's office, uh, this discussion about uh, the difference of opinion about how to handle criminal investigations. Um, is the handling of criminal investigations a component of a security plan? Well, I heard the Office of Inspector General talk to the issue of police operations, and as I mentioned, Task two uh, of our uh, contract addresses the question of police operations as they apply to the collection security. Uh, and certainly the placement or the interface between the Inspector General's office and the police would certainly be a proper part of that uh, analysis and investigation. And how about the, uh, the relationship between the U.S. Attorney and I think we would be getting beyond the scope of our uh, expertise there. I, I think that's more of a legal issue and not a, mm -hmm. a security and police operations issue. Uh, and I just one last attempt at this then. Uh, would it make any difference, do you think, from a security standpoint, if it were well known that, uh, uh, that in addition to reporting to U.S. Attorney uh, District Court level, I think was the point that was being made, um, that in addition to that, there would be FBI involvement, that uh, the reporting would go uh, on the, what is it, Interpol? Is that the, uh, this in, in other words, that there would be, would that be a greater deterrent, I guess? Well, certainly to the degree that uh, uh, widespread police interest and law enforcement interest uh, in the security or involvement in the security of the uh, library, that certainly would uh, probably act as a further deterrent. Uh, my understanding of the discussion that took place earlier was that it was really a question of legality or whose proper uh, venue this belonged to and uh, uh, not necessarily an involvement with respect to security. But certainly, the, the, in the security business, we advocate uh, signage, which we call signage that, that uh, widely publicizes the fact that 
criminal activity is uh, uh, subject to uh, stiff penalty, enforcement, that, that type of thing. So what you're indicating would probably be true as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Parker. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, uh, in your statement, you mentioned that the uh, security um, or the det metal detectors were not working. Is that because they were malfunctioning or were they just turned off? They were off? not operational. They were, uh, they had not been placed into operation. None of them? None of them. Did you inquire as to why? My understanding is that that is an issue uh, between the library and the unions. I see. Uh, you gained access to unauthorized areas. Um, was that difficult? We, we gained access to unauthorized areas, not to, not to us. We had, I think what you're referring to here is the fact that uh, they asked us to look at the stack areas. We did. I uh, took uh, the badge and the stack pass that I had uh, been issued. Uh, I placed those inside my pocket so that they were not visible. So therefore, basically, I should have been questioned from a, a security, a proper security procedure. I should have been questioned uh, the first time I was uh, uh, came into contact with a library employee. I was not. You consider, you consider that a serious problem? I consider it a serious problem, yes. It's not unusual, but I, I consider it a serious problem. You also indicated that even though the stacks have been closed since 92, uh, it, is, it is minimally inhibiting uh, of any public access. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not sure that I would agree that it's minimally inhibiting. There are areas from the where the public has access, or where the public typically uh, operates and moves, uh, that you can get into the stack area. You can get into the stack area unnoticed. Um, and once you're in the stack area, you virtually have unlimited movement within the stack area in that particular building. Do you have exit uh, opportunities within the stack area that would not take you through security measures? That is correct. Uh, are there architectural modifications that could be done to improve the long-term security uh, in as much as the architect of the Capitol is overseeing this, the Library of Congress? We have not yet reached the point where we would be making recommendations or considerations with respect to security enhancements that would involve architectural modifications. My understanding is that there are some severe restrictions because of the historical nature of the building. Uh, I'm not sure if those would be totally prohibitive or not. Uh, part of the security problem, I think, has to revolve around the, uh, the remote uh, storage facilities that the library has. Have you looked into the, 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 that component of the security problem? That is part of our charter, and uh, we have looked at the Landover Center Annex, and about a week and a half ago, we delivered to the library uh, an approximately 50-page report with, along with six or seven annexes that uh, dealt with the security uh, findings that we had with respect to that facility. Did, did a good part of the mutilation and, and theft problem uh, involve uh, remote uh, storage facilities? We found some instances of theft at the remote facility. Uh, we have read the investigation with respect to uh, some of those uh, thefts. Uh, we are looking at what the library does from a policy and procedure standpoint and from a standpoint of the equipment that they have in place and are making recommendations that we believe will uh, enhance their security posture and limit the opportunity for f uh, future theft to occur. We've approved the funding of a new, new facility, uh, remote storage facilities for the library. Uh, will, your, will your review, your six-month review, involve those, those new facilities as it relates to, to security? I believe you're referring to the uh, uh, new facility at Fort Meade? Yes. Uh, no, our charter is not in that area. Uh, that'll be a question perhaps for the library and later on to see if, in fact, there is some uh, addressing of that issue. Lastly, uh, the tunnel between the Cannon and the Madison building has a policeman at both ends with no exit or no, no, uh, um, no exit between those two policemen. Uh, is, that a, uh, is there a better way of using... Uh, um, Personnel, security personnel, could not one do the job of both? 
I think it depends. On, I'm not familiar with that particular point because we have not yet reached that area in it's a, our... It's a minimal issue, really, but it's just a point that maybe we could review the entire use of the, of the, of the security measures we uh, are so that we do not have redundancy. That would, that would be part of the security survey that we are conducting. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Packard. The committee will stand at recess until 2 o'clock. The final hour and a half of this hearing will continue in a few moments. High school seniors, Campaign 96 is here. And the C-SPAN $100,000 National Scholarship Competition is on. What effect will C-SPAN programming have on my first presidential vote? It's your answer that could be the winner. What's really happening is live, so there's nothing that's, I mean, there's no rhetoric or whatever you want to call it put into the program because it's done live. It's not what, it's not what your C-SPAN is saying. It's what's actually being said. The national grand prize is a $5,000 scholarship and a trip to Washington, D.C. Over 160 prizes in all. So what do you think? What effect will C-SPAN programming have on my first presidential vote? High school seniors, answer the question any creative way you like and send entries with an official entry form by March 1st, 1996. For details and an entry form, call 202-626-4355. Our email address is cspanedc at aol.com or send a self-addressed business size stamped envelope to C-SPAN $100,000 National Scholarship Competition, 400 North Capitol Street Northwest, Suite 650, Washington, D.C., 20001. C-SPAN, the political network of record. C-SPAN 2, a public service created by America's cable television companies. In a moment, we'll continue with a hearing on security and management at the Library of Congress. But first, this programming information. At 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific, we'll bring you a debate by candidates for Oregon's open Senate seat. And following that, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 8.30 Pacific, we'll show you an interview with Republican presidential candidate Pat Buchanan. Now we continue with a hearing on security and management at the Library of Congress. Last November, the Senate Rules and Administration Committee and the House Oversight Committee heard testimony from Librarian of the Congress James Billington. He discussed the library's collection security, financial management, and general management practices. Oregon Senator Mark Hatfield chairs this hearing, which continues for another hour and a half. The hearing will resume. <clears throat> Our final witness is Dr. James H. Billington, the library, library of Congress's 13th librarian. <clears throat> Dr. Billington is well-known author, historian, director, having directed the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for almost 15 years at the Smithsonian. Prior to that, the Woodrow Wilson Center of International Studies at Princeton. And as the librarian of Congress since 1987, Dr. Billington has brought a fresh perspective to the library. His ability to reach out into the private community and express the importance of the Library of Congress has been exceptional. Dr. Billington has agreed to share with us today a brief overview of the status of the Library of Congress relating to collections, security, financial management, and general management. He will then field questions from the members. Dr. Billington, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the Joint Committee and Legislative uh, Branch Subcommittees. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be able to appear before you today. I have a... Excuse me. Would you pull that... You practically oh. have to chew on that microphone to okay. make it work. 
Fine. <laughs> um, I have a prepared statement that I would ask be made part of the official record of this, this hearing, with your permission, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to just summarize it uh, briefly, if I may, and then respond to your questions. The Library of Congress is the largest and most diverse record of human knowledge and creativity ever assembled on this planet. It has a clear mission summarized on this first chart here. And it has a particularly challenge, I would say even historic, current task of simultaneously rendering more efficient its basic services to Congress and the nation, and at the same time pioneering a major transition to the new electronic services required for the information age. The library now provides many more services with many fewer people than when I became librarian eight years ago. Our productivity, for instance, in, in cataloging, which every year saves the nation's libraries as much money as our entire annual appropriation, has risen from 195,000 annual entries, items uh, completed in 1988 to 276,000 in 1995. Our electronic information transactions have grown from almost nothing to about one million per day. We are also answering more congressional information requests, providing more free reading materials to the blind and physically handicapped, registering more copyrights, answering more copyright requests, and so forth, as this second chart shows. Now, none of this would have been possible without the steadiness and recent support of the Congress of the United States. And I deeply appreciate the opportunity today to thank once again the Congress, which has surpassed the Medici's and any royal family in the patronage of a great library. And I deeply appreciate the opportunity to appear here before you today, since we're anxious for more, not for less scrutiny of all we do, and for more detailed understanding, uh, not uh, less. So we welcome all the constructive criticism and suggestions that consultants will be providing. We appreciate congressional interest and involvement in this unique institution. And I'm glad to have a chance to describe for you today how we were handling a number of specific infrastructure issues about which recent concern has been expressed. Collection security was the subject of my last testimony before the Joint Committee two years ago, and it's a main focus again today. But this is only one of several areas where the library has had to start from behind in recent years, and in which we have made, I believe, considerable, if sometimes tortuous, progress. When I took office in September 1987, I saw that the library, for a variety of reasons, had lagged badly behind in its financial systems, its human resources management, and in clearing up its vast arrearage of uncatalogued materials. These three practical matters had to be resolved over the long term and became the early focus of extra staff, money, and management attention. There is still a lot to be done, but thanks to the Congress's support and the staff's hard work, we are in far better shape than in 1988 and are on track for further gains. In his testimony today, Mr. Gadsby reminded the committee of the abysmal condition of the library's financial system when I first asked GAO early in 1988 to conduct what has been the first full financial statement audit in the long history of the Library of Congress. As GAO reported in 1991 and the library's inspector general noted in his 1992 follow-up to the GAO report, the library began immediately the extensive and costly process of putting our finances in order even before the GAO audit had been completed. Now, because the problems cited by GAO were long-standing and systemic, the library, in essence, had to discard totally its old way of handling financial transactions and start building a new system. Each year since the 1991 GAO report was issued, the GAO's status reports to Congress have noted that the library has been doing what needs to be done. The library has implemented six of the GAO's eight recommendations and completed action on 16 of its 19 findings, and I have included a detailed accounting of this progress with my formal statement. The library's plan called for an overall financial audit for fiscal year 1996, 
but in fact the audit will now come a year earlier. We welcome the GAO's current review of the steps taken since 1991 to put the library on a firm foundation, and we also want that critical evaluation of our progress. In the meantime, internal audits of various library activities were conducted by the Inspector General, another new position that I created at the library, and to which I gave my support and complete investigative independence from the very start. The issue of statutory authority was proposed to me once and only once in 1989, but frankly never presented as a burning issue or followed up. After we got an assistant IG for investigations last April, and when it seemed that we had some serious allegations to look into in August, it made sense to move forward with the statute, particularly in order to provide the IG with subpoena power. The IG has expressed frustration over what he saw as lack of adequate budget and staff, so of others in my office, such in particular the Financial Services and also the Office of the General Counsel, uh, both of which were denied requests for increases in, in critical resources. The IG was not being singled out. In fact, the IG staff increased from 7 to 11 overall through 1995, even when the library's overall staffing declined more than 10 percent. We have lost 486 funded FTEs since fiscal year 1987. We asked Congress unsuccessfully for added resources for the Inspector General in 1990, in 1992, and in 1994. We also unsuccessfully asked Congress in 1994 to, uh, for the funds to conduct a full financial statement audit. Congress now seems more receptive, and so we are glad to be moving ahead. In human resources, we face long-standing problems of equal opportunity and staff development, as discussed in my full statement. We've increased diversity, installed major new human development programs, hired new managers in key areas from outside the library, and seen the U.S. District Court approve in September the settlement of a key class action suit that first originated as an EEO complaint in 1975, though a few class members are appealing. In the last area of my early concern, the reduction of our massive backlog of uncatalogued items, our staff received particularly strong support from the Congress and has responded heroically by reducing the backlog in our collections from a peak uh, of 40.5 million uncatalogued items in 1988 to 23 million by June 20th of this year, while keeping current with new acquisitions. This 42 percent reduction has materially contributed to collection security, particularly in the special collections, as does our ongoing overall inventory of our general book collection, which has now covered 16.5 of our 19 classes of books. Collection security became another and a especially important high priority area when staff members showed me examples of past mutilations, alerted me that it might be continuing, and library police apprehended three individual thieves and slashers who were convicted. Early in 1992, I ordered the stacks totally closed to the public, radically reduced staff access to the stacks, and identified and implemented an extensive list of collection security measures. Our staff has accomplished much of what we set out to do in 1992. This chart, this third chart here shows some of the measures taken, just a very few of a very long list. Uh, and I I think it's fair to say this is not just a, a list of things that are desired to do. We are talking about things that have been actually done. 142 surveillance cameras installed, 113 more to go in this year, 117 cages installed to house high-risk collections, theft detection targets installed in 3 million books and other materials, detection gates at library exits, electronic controls on all stacked doors in the Jefferson and Adams buildings, mandatory photo IDs for users of our collections, and, and many, many other measures. My formal statement spells this out in detail, what we've been doing in our continuing long-range security effort backed by the Congress. It also describes what we have done since early August when I first heard of complaints from the U.S. Attorney's Office and allegations of reprisals against a library of staff member who was being separated, prompting congressional concern. I immediately ordered our Assistant Inspector General to investigate with the help of the FBI. I directed the captain of the library of police to report all criminal information to Mr. Keeler and issued new procedures for staff to follow when they suspected theft or mutilation of collections materials. We brought in Computer Sciences Corporation to do a 
quick two-day survey of our current effort, and they pointed out some weaknesses which we are fixing while we await their more extensive study. Contrary to some press reports, Mr. Chairman, there is no evidence of any recent outbreak of thefts and mutilations in the stacks. There has been persistent misrepresentation of an inventory we made of damage discovered since 1992, largely as a result of increased security efforts by the staff. This does not represent an inventory of mutilations that has actually happened since 1992. Much, if not almost all of it, occurred earlier. We and the FBI are aggressively investigating some damage that was done to valuable materials apparently by two different predators in the general collection stack sometime in 1993 and 1994, and also one act of thievery in a special collection after August 1995. Aside from these cases, however, we have no firm evidence of major damage done since closing the stacks and beginning our aggressive security policies in 1992, and we have many reasons for believing that most of it happened earlier. I regret that the members of the committee did not have more of an opportunity this morning to ask questions of Mr. Keeler. I would like, therefore, to highlight some key points from Mr. Keeler's recent update that he provided to me. As he completes his investigations, we will be reporting key findings to you. I charge Mr. Keeler to investigate whether or not mutilation and theft was an ongoing problem, as well as uh, charged him with investigation of the library's relationship to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let me quote, and I'm quoting directly from Mr. Keeler's notes to me. I'm quoting. Since August 3, 1995, we have seen evidence of a reasonable small amount of mutilation, theft of unbound material and unmicrofilmed materials such as current magazines and newspapers, respectively. There was no clear or formal agreement between the U.S. Attorney's Office and the L.C. Police. Alleged thefts from specific decks are currently under investigation by OIG special agents under the supervision of the AIG, the Assistant uh, Inspector General, that is, and special agents with the FBI. This is another, I'm still quoting. There was no violation of law, rule, or regulation by any library official in connection with their relationship with the U.S. Attorney's Office and their failure to, fully com to comply fully with requests made of the L Library of Congress police by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Still quoting, the Library of Congress police detectives had conducted a reasonably aggressive and appropriate investigation of the mutilation theft on decks uh, 45 and 49, including the use of video surveillance equipment. And the final quote, there is no clear or compelling evidence that the reporting delay by the Library of Congress police has hampered further investigation and prosecution. Uh, end of quote. Now, Mr. Chairman, I take no consolation from the fact that damage may be less than people have been led to believe. I have always insisted that no loss at all from the Library's unique collections is tolerable. It is exasperating that there have been delays and human lapses in communication and coordination since 1992 between the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Library, between curators and security people within the Library, and in reporting problems up the line within the Library. But I believe we are fixing these problems, and I personally will continue to give the highest priority to the protection of America's stored memory. Moreover, I would like to work in any way I can to encourage the pursuit, prosecution, and sentencing of those who vandalize the nation's patrimony. The sad fact, however, is that we are still vulnerable. Even with far more dollars and resources than we have yet been given, there will always remain a security threat to the library, barring a radical improvement in human nature. With 108 million items on 532 miles of shelving that have to be served by hundreds of staff within buildings that are in active public use and were never designed for security, with 48,000 items arriving every day to be sorted and processed for that small number that will be retained for the collection, with a library that must serve the Congress scholars and others who are naturally preoccupied with access today rather than preservation for tomorrow. So security would not be a simple task, even in the best of times. What we have been doing, and will be doing steadily in the future, is to reduce the risk to the collections of theft and mutilation by blocking, deterring, and pursuing thieves and slashers while better tracking the items in our collection. The library staff is, is already, as I indicated in my statement, doing far more now 
with fewer people. We have extraordinary talent and dedication in this institution. I believe that we are basically on a good track, and I hope that the current GAO study will help us work even better. As the library quickly moves now towards the 21st century and towards its own 200th anniversary in the year 2000, there are many challenges ahead and exciting electronic opportunities for providing, elect, for providing many of its services directly to your constituents throughout the country. Our people have already begun on this and are eager to develop the networked and innovative external services required for the future. I would welcome the opportunity to work with the members of the Joint Committee to examine more thoroughly how the library might best serve Congress and the nation and to take that longer strategic look that Mr. Thomas has um, already eloquently called for. In the meantime, in the short term, the library would benefit from a number of specific actions by the Congress. I will outline these in greater detail for the committee in the next few weeks, but a few are worth mentioning now. Granting the library's IG statutory independence, resolving GAO's long-standing concern already expressed this morning about the need for proper authority for the library's gift revolving funds, and addressing how the library should operate within the framework being developed by the Compliance Board for the legislative branch. I hope to continue our recent practice of providing you with more regular reports. We would welcome more frequent oversight hearings, particularly to discuss those long-term policy issues raised by our new statement of the mission and strategic priorities that I recently sent you and which we posted as our first item. We will need both the material help and the new statutory authority that I will be discussing with you in the coming months, and I would be glad, Mr. Chairman, to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Billington. Dr. Billington, I find certain statistics <clears throat> intriguing as well as uh, incomprehensible. Physically, the library's collections are housed in 532 miles of shelves. That boggles my mind. If I were to look at Eugene, Oregon, and go 532 miles, that would be to San Francisco. And that would still be four hours north of Vice Chairman Thomas' congressional district in the state of California. Just a little trivia. Uh, I have a few questions, and I would like to also say that other colleagues uh, may have questions who are not able to be here to hear you, Dr. Billington, and I will keep the record open for two weeks uh, for any colleagues uh, who may wish to pose questions to you or other members of this, this hearing today so that everyone has had a free and total opportunity to uh, pursue uh, matters of concern. And also, as I indicated at the opening of the session, uh, this is but the first of a series of hearings that we have discussed. And uh, in order to broaden and maintain a comprehensive approach, uh, we will schedule other hearings relating to human resources and all those various agencies that have a part to play uh, in that as panels to testify. You assert, uh, and I quote, uh, that had there been a statutory, uh, let me, let me get back to my, let me first start with the obstacles that uh, you consider as major obstacles in your effort to improve security at the library. What have been in the past and what are currently your obstacles? What are the obstacles to <coughs> achieving security? to improve the security in the library. Have you had obstacles? Do you still have obstacles? Well, there are all kinds of obstacles, as I think I already have, have indicated. I mean, you begin with the whole um, culture of openness, which, as a practicing scholar and one-time user of the library, I feel very strong sympathy with. You begin with the 
um, the uh, fact that um, this was a, thought to be an established entitlement. In fact, if you recall at the last hearings uh, on this subject in 1993, most of the witnesses were were more or less pummeling, pummeling me for having taken such draconian security measures as uh, shutting the stacks. And I, I sympathized and understood that. I had three public forums to explain it, and, uh, but it's understandable. I mean, there was a culture of openness. The buildings themselves were not designed with security in mind. They're designed with a certain elegance so that you don't have the controllable sight lines, for instance, in the reading rooms. Uh, you don't, you, you had a, a kind of virtual openness of the stacks, um, and you had a, a, a perfectly understandable desire and sympathy on the part of scholars and employees alike to, uh, to make a fuller, uh, fuller and freer, freer use of the stacks. So that was uh, one very large obstacle. Um, and perhaps, uh, I mean, both the physical and the psychological um, resistance to any policy of security. Um, there is, there are, of course, obstacles in, in um, uh, funding. I, I don't, I don't want to dwell on that. I mean, we, we identified a, a very large list and were able to do quite a significant number. And we, in fact, reprogrammed two and a half million dollars from other other resources with the co Congress's approval, but the, the new monies that we asked for for this were, were not forthcoming from the Congress, about 4.6 uh, million since 92, but we appreciated the Congress's direction and, uh, and endorsement of our reprogramming money. But dealing in a basically flat budget scene where we were absorbing uh, a great, uh, almost every year, um, uh, mandated and unfunded pay uh, increases in, in a payroll which is sorry, in a uh, budget which is 70 percent personnel um, we were basically dealing with a resource problem in in uh, dealing with this um, I think um, uh, we I, I think the various steps that we've taken uh, with the resources that we had at our disposal I hope that the CFC people will agree I think in retrospect it might have been good to have begun with this sort of strategic overview that they had in mind, but uh, I think that uh, we had always planned to bring in a consultant after. The, the problem is that the, that, the, that the security problem is so diverse when you're dealing with 22 reading rooms, when you're dealing with a whole variety of different formats, it seemed to us at the time that to get the whole library working on this in their individual domains, and we in fact had three consultants, three different consultants for specialized parts of the library, because there's really no analogy to the Library of Congress. Uh, it was brought up earlier, for instance, um, uh, uh, Senator Warner brought up uh, uh, very eloquently the point that uh, this is a common problem to all repositories, and I'd like to sure, reassure the Congress, my deputy did a, a very good study of 21 other major repositories, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that his conclusion was that we have by far the most diverse and aggressive program um, uh, that could be devised. But I think uh, perhaps, uh, and, and so we had always intended to have next year the comprehensive external review of the sum total of all the individual things we've done. But I think it's fair to say it probably would have been good uh, in retrospect to have had a um, a, a comprehensive overview at the beginning, but still that was not the major inhibiting factor. The major inhibiting factor is the physical, um, awesome, dawning physical question of the size of the collections, the, the, um, the, the lack of security programmed into the buildings, and a culture designed for service and access rather than uh, much more than for security. And um, that uh, so there, there are many other uh, obstacles. But Dr. Uh, Billy, let me pursue the resource issue yeah. that you raise for just a moment. In 1992, I believe you published uh, or issued a plan for enhancing collection security. Uh, it involves many things, as I understand, uh, the collection security regulations and determine the need for full-time collection security officers and evaluating the effect effectiveness of security initiatives. What I'd like to have you do, and I'm not asking for your response now, but I wish I would like to have you provide for the record. 
take the first budget following your issuing of such a plan in 1992 for enhancing the collection security. Take the budget requests that you put into your budget. Give, give us the figures. Give us the figure after OMB processed your budget. OMB doesn't process, Mr. Chairman. They do not. No. You no, do report directly yes, here. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I had forgotten that. But give us the figure that you requested in each of those years following and how much money was actually appropriated compared to your request level. Can you tell us today in general perhaps whether we appropriated less on the target or more than the requests that you made through your budget process? We request $4.6 million dollars total uh, over those years. I could break it down in the, I have the figures here, here they are. Um, uh, it was 4.6 million as I, as I remember, and we did not uh, receive any of it. But we did, that was new money, however, in fairness to the Congress, there was active interest in and support for the reprogramming of two and a half million dollars worth of money. So. Um, we, Let's stop there a moment. That's new money, yeah. The, the figure that you had requested for in implementing your plan for enhancing collection security at the time you requested it was a total of how much? I think here, here's the, here are the exact figures. Um, I don't want to misrepresent this. But it was 4.3 million is, is the figure, 4.36. 4.3 million you asked for well, implementation. Well, it was requested. Now, 2.5 million was allowed, but it was done by reallocation and reprogramming rather than new I money. So it, that's let's back up. Let's do this very slowly. I want to make sure we walk it through for clear understanding. You requested 4.3 million that's right. in new money. Of the that's 4. 93 through 96. 93, 96. Of the 4.3 you received no appropriations for new money, but instead you got two and a half million in reprogramming? No, it was allowed. I think the, the correct terminology is that 2.5 of the 4.3 was allowed, but it was done through reallocation and reprogramming. What we call reprogramming. Yes, sir. From existing accounts. That's right. Yes, sir. All right. Once again, with your patience, 4.5 you requested. 4.3, I'm sorry. 4.3 you requested from 93 to 96 for implementation of a plan for enhancing collection security. No new money in response to those requests were appropriated, but instead 2.5 of your 4.3 request level were reprogrammed dollars. So in other words, you, have, you had a uh, almost half or a little less than half of what you requested. No, it's a little more than half, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's a little more than half. 4.3 and 2. Yep. Point, yes. Yep. But just about half instead of the f full amount. Did that, excuse me, was there? Would you yield a minute on that program? Because I've, I've become very confused. We met with, the, my staff met with the, your budget people yesterday to get this very point cleared up. And the figures that I have before me that were, alloc that were requested and the amount that were allowed Either, uh, primarily through re reprogramming is far different than what I'm hearing today, and I, I'm, I'm not sure. What I have is I have 3.7 million uh, that was requested from 93 to, to the present, um, and 3.3 was allocated or was allowed, leaving only a difference of uh, 300 and, um, and uh, some thousand dollars. Uh, well, and I'm not sure where where I where these figures yeah. came from, but they they were as a result of a meeting with your people with your finance people. Um, Do you have a fiscal officer? Who yes, you, I, I don't know, Mr. Who can clarify this for us, Mr. West? He's got a book enough, big enough to. This is John Webster, our chief financial officer, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe uh, John Hemperley, our budget officer, did meet with uh, preparation staff. And <clears throat> Dr. Billington, the numbers Dr. Billington has is what was in our request, and I guess it's determining what is collection security. This might be some definitional issues about what is collection security and what is security. And we can certainly work that through. 
But we identified in our numbers 4.3 million and of what was requested in the 93 through 96 budget requests. The, um, the 2.5 million is what was officially at reallocated, but there were some requests that we had in the initial 4.3 million that we were able to achieve through other, through not official reprogramming, but through within the allocation limits within those uh, uh, current budget that we have. Well, I guess so it could be, I think it does work out to a little bit more than 2.5 if you take the, the amounts that were not officially re, uh, reprogrammed or requested authority to reprogram, but things that were done within our in individual authority within the accounts. Could we get the green eye shade people to review all of this, uh, these statistics? Because I think it's an important point I'm trying to get at to whether or not you've been handicapped by a lack of resources from a Congress that has not been as responsive as it might have been. I'm not trying to find blame anywhere. I'm just trying to find out what to the response of the Appropriations Committee. I'm now going to put on my appropriations hat, as uh, Chairman Packard has, and uh, want to pursue this to con uh, convince uh, ourselves that we are being responsive or that we are not being responsive. Let me ask you, in terms of this uh, plan, how have these security measures that you called for in 1992 been implemented? What percentage and how would you rate the effectiveness of this plan as it has been implemented thus far? Well, I think, I mean, there's quite a long list of things that were, that were implemented in 92. I don't know that I have a, I can give you off the top of my head a numerical could you provide the details? I'll the provide record? you all the details. But I mean, a very important, a great many, both big things, such as securing the, all the delivery book stations, closing the stacks, uh, things of that kind, um, uh, the beginnings of, of this uh, 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 tagging program, so the ta tagging books was, uh, was done, large things like that, was small things like sealing, mailing, uh, out all kinds of things. I mean, the kinds of things that we're talking about here, um, the caging began right away. The major caging was done right away. Video surveillance cameras were put in uh, right away, uh, or very nearly right away, so that you have a, uh, I think there's, there's quite a, but I would love to submit for the record what was done since 92, if you like, what was done since, in fact, I have a, have a list that I could, I could give you, you or read. Yeah read here what was done since 94 with the revised plan and what has been done since uh, since August with the uh, renewed concern that's been expressed about all this. In the CSC contract that they are currently performing, do you see a opportunity for involvement of your Inspector General in that CSC review? Yes, I would, I would think so. I mean, um, uh, we, would, we would expect so, the, particularly, uh, I mean, the Assistant Inspector General has been doing these, this very exhaustive study and have a lot to, to offer, and I would, I would assume that they would work closely together. Based upon the CSC two-day walkthrough and as they have described their current uh, mission under contract, uh, do you foresee that this is a matter of supplementing your 1992 plan for enhanced security, or do you see this as a setting aside and starting from a new structure? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand you that. You had this plan in 1992 yes. for enhancing the security. CSC is now under contract to give you a comprehensive review. Are you, on the basis of the information that has been given this committee on their two-day walkthrough and on the missions that they have described now, do you see the completion of that as being a brand new structure to build, rebuild, or do you see it as melding with your current plan underway that you announced in 1992? I think it's um, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, up to what they conclude. We had always it had always been part of the plan. In '92 it was part of my original charge when we formed the security committee and drew up the plan that. There should be a comprehensive review after we had done all the discrete things in the different parts of the library that needed to be done, and they had had their own sub-consultants. So this was always the plan. All we're doing is doing it, we've begun it a year earlier 
just as we're doing the financial audit a year earlier. Now, um, I think the whole point of having an external review is to determine whether you need to have some kind of uh, fresh start or whether you, you can build on the, I, I, I cannot conceive and our, certainly our indications are not that, that they would want to dismantle and the discrete measures that we've taken of so many different sorts, their standard uh, practice they, uh, and uh, our preliminary indications are quite positive. But I mean, I, would, I don't want to foreclose anything. That's the whole point of getting consultants is to get a totally fresh, fresh look and a fresh evaluation of, of everything we've done. Dr. Pillington, uh, would you provide for the record my last request? Uh, the restructuring of your management, particularly at the senior level, that you have uh, uh, that you have implemented uh, here recently, and also, uh, I would like to have you specifically look at that and describe how it relates more precisely, not just to additional efficiencies of the entire library but how it relates to collection security and financial management, how you feel you have strengthened or what you have done in your restructuring. I also would like to have in that information a list of the previous management revisions that have occurred, say, in the last 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, some point of reference. No, with, with of course, with pleasure. I mean, the basic uh, point of this, I mean, Reorganization is no magic bullet, uh, but there's been a steady theme, uh, at least since I've been librarian, which is to slim it down, make it smaller, more accountable. We now have a five-man, five-person, I should say, executive uh, committee, um, which is uh, uh, which the creation of which has uh, resulted in the elimination of a couple of uh, service units. The slimming, there's been a slimming down from 17 person management team, which I inherited and through several reorganizations into this, but um, the, uh, I'll be happy to provide you with, with all the details. And um, would, would you describe in general a, a more collective senior level uh, role in management as, say, against a strictly a vertical structure? Yes. I mean, I had an original Arthur Young I brought at the same time as I requested the first financial audit, I think that I requested the most comprehensive management review as soon as I came in, and that was awarded Arthur Young and Company. And uh, following their recommendations and following modern management practice, we wanted to, f you know, flatten out management, have a smaller, smaller group at the top, but to have a much more diffused authority within the group, uh, within the management uh, team, and get rid of the kind of excessively hierarchical structures in the past. And indeed, the credit, when you talk about the enormous success in cataloging, that has a lot to do with new techniques of matrix management, team management. That's why we're doing so much better. We had a kind of uh, old-fashioned General Motors assembly line <coughs> approach. We introduced the whole book approach. It was, it was very traumatic for many of our people, but this is the kind of whole secret of modern management. It works in some areas better than in others, but uh, this, we've been following that kind, of, that kind of matrix team approach, which of course is unsettling to many who are accustomed to more hierarchical and rigid structures. And in a, uh, but those have, been the, those have been the guiding principles, and uh, I think we feel that, uh, we felt uh, before these August events, we had been studying for a year and a half the question of uh, slimming down, getting a, uh, getting a management system that could derive budget from strategic plan rather than just from the inertia of past budgets. And that's what we're, we're aiming to do this year uh, as, to, uh, as we enter the second phase of our strategic plan, which we drew up in the, in the early 90s. Have you experienced a significant increase in the quantity of information under this new structure? Oh, yes. I mean, we're dealing, as I've indicated, we're, we're getting more done with less with less people in almost no, every... Of information. Of information. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the flooding of the, of the Internet is, uh, yes. is just incredible. And this creates, in turn, the need for a new type of person. That's why our human resources issues are, are, are so extremely important, because we've got... People have got to retool not only to the more matrix-oriented modern management method, but they have to um, 
be prepared to deal with the kind of new innovative technologies and the new kind of uh, network relationships which are very difficult for a turf-oriented, highly regulated, very traditional structure. You have the combination, I mean, they're wonderful things, but you have the combinations of a government um, structure with nearly 200 years of regulation, some of them self-imposed, some of them mandated from a variety of sources, with uh, one of the lowest turnover rates in government, a kind of um, academic tenure system, which is fine, but I mean, to get things done to both improve the efficiency of traditional activities at the same, not to interrupt them at the same time you're moving into the leadership position, which I think this institution has very uh, significantly assumed in the new digital universe, uh, is, um, is a major task. And I think our people have been doing heroic work, and I, I would be nice if if it were noticed a little more of the, the positive things. I mentioned, might mention the collective management people, 250 frontline people. I've met with them recently, and they're doing terrific things in, uh, and have a dedication to this security effort that's gratifying and I think is largely responsible for the relative success we've had despite the continuing problems. Thank you, Dr. Bill Uh Chairman Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator uh, Warner, Chairman of the Rules Committee, I think properly chastised me for using padlock as an example of the security. Gently. I was trying, I was gently. gently. I was just noticing over here on the uh, graph, there's a, there's a large padlock. Uh, <laughs> however, I put the brake to good use and I sat and made myself think of what I actually meant. What I actually meant was a watchdog whether electronic or not, so well trained that every time you said sickament knew with unerring accuracy who you meant. Uh, and I think uh, most of what we have up there is in effect that kind of an approach, notwithstanding the closing of the stacks, but the surveillance cameras, the, the reader registration cards and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the concerns that I have, Dr. Billington, and I know I've shared it with you in, in a number of meetings, uh, has been that notwithstanding the obvious changing role of the Library of Congress and of the personnel in it, uh, hopefully we'll have a changing role in the oversight of Congress toward the library. Uh, you are now moving toward an independent um, resource so that you can be guided by professional evaluations in the area of management, finance, security, and that sort of thing. And that I think for too long, historically, uh, oversight uh, basically meant looking at the particular hiring or firing of individuals and very often requirements that you carry out personal whims of individuals rather than uh, a comprehensive policy-based evaluation of how we might best uh, enable you to carry out your job. Your problem, as was the case again, using the House as an analogy, is that there's just not a, a real baseline out there in, in which you can make the kind of uh, judgments that you need in finances, damage to the collection, uh, the policy of role in the management. The chairman talked about the question of management over the last uh, 20, 30, or 50 years, or whatever the appropriate uh, benchmark would be used. And I believe I'm correct that just in the time that you've come on board, there have been, uh, I think, at least three reorganizations of management, and I think that's somewhat reflective, frankly, of the time period in which you became librarian. You've had to, within a, a relatively brief period of time, jump what would otherwise be uh, not just a decade, but almost a century of a rethink of what the library is and how it operates. In fact, I think the whole role of the library, um, not just the question of finances and management, but even the role of the librarian. I don't think you fully appreciated how much you were going to do outreach, uh, it, not only in terms of a PR aspect of the library, which I think you've done a marvelous job on, uh, but the question of collecting f finances uh, along with that, uh, coming back with something when you reached out uh, to assist the changes. So. I want to ask a question based upon that as a background, which frankly hasn't been directly addressed, and I want your answer. Because when you talk about all these transitions that you've gone through, uh, the whole question of a library and its resources 
and the interaction of those resources with its users and uh, the complete transition into the digital, the outreach on CDs rather than hard copy, um, the, the format, the way in which librarians utilize the resources that they have, the question of the time frame in which these kinds of changes are, are being asked to be made in the resources that you have available talked about management in terms of a flatter structure, flexibility in terms of what folks do for jobs different than perhaps they had anticipated or have been doing for years, a flexibility, uh, lack of hierarchy. Those are terms that tend to historically bump into a structure which uh, has a, a, a relatively high degree of, of union uh, structure. So my first question is, how many employees do you have? Well, we have about 4,600. <laughs> about 4,600. What percentage of those are unionized? Oh, my. I could ballpark. give you the uh, ballpark, uh, I don't know, um, maybe something like I mean, we have three unions, and, they're, and they have um, negotiating rights for, for all of the workforce. So there's a difference between how many people are represented and how many people are actually And how much paying, influence they have in the ability to control. I'm looking at the number. For example, just take one example, uh, the security initiatives you have yeah. up there. The closing of the stacks, uh, who has access to it, the reader registration, phase one, and then the phase two electric electronic reader aspect, uh, a, a number of what, the electronic control of stack doors, who gets uh, the kinds of keys, who doesn't, all of that, where the, where the cameras are located, uh, wh what they watch or who they watch, uh, all of that sounds to me like you would have to probably work with, uh, 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 I don't want to say work against, work with unions in trying to resolve those kinds of, mm -hmm. of questions. Uh, is that the case or not? Yes, of course. I mean, much of this has to be bargained. I guess there's uh, about 3,000 people represented, although many by the unions, although many less are, in fact, dues-paying dues -paying members. But uh, yes, we have to bargain all these things, and in some cases, uh, it's, uh, it's very lengthy. I mean, for instance, we, well, there was great problems. I mean, many of them, no doubt, uh, legitimate concerns about what it means when you seal the stacks. Um, but that takes time, and now when you then when you try to, uh, for instance, we wanted to get no-go gates like we have there at the, uh, I think it was the periodicals and and um, uh, government publications room. It took uh, 17, 18 months of negotiation before we were able to do it. Um, so those are certainly uh, those are certainly problems. I mean, it takes. So when you come up with time. the potential solution, you lose 18 months trying to convince folk who. Doesn't involved always with that process to go forward. Doesn't always uh, take that long, but there, there's uh, everything. Uh, many things have to be negotiated. We have a new uh, uh, person um, in charge of uh, labor relations, and we're working on trying to create a better environment. But there has certainly been a tendency to to bargain right through to impasse, and uh, and uh, that takes just takes a great deal of time. And I must say, apart from the time it, it takes, it takes a tremendous amount of time, both on both sides, away from the substance of work into the process of, a, of an adversarial proceeding. So it's, um, it, it, of course, it's, it's, it, it takes time. Now, when you say you negotiate, obviously negotiation tends to mean a give and take on both sides. Did you ever feel that during any of those processes of negotiation that you were reaching a point of, of having to compromise what it was that you were looking for in the area of security or procedures because of the position of the unions? No, I mean, I was strongly resisted by... That's why it took by, so long. By the unions. <laughs> well, no, I was strongly resisted in closing the stacks. I mean, you had people uh, testifying formally sure. and, and protesting informally, and you still do, saying that that was, uh, that itself was a was a terrible thing. You just well, I'm not thinking of any specific example. It's just that in the negotiations, did you ever feel that, that your goal of, of a particular type of security could possibly have been compromised by the concessions through negotiations with the unions? I, I'd have to discuss 
in detail with the people who have okay. done the labor, labor negotiating before I could respond to that. Uh, I, I think that it is that, that the, the problem is more one of delay than a fundamental yeah. compromise because I think that the instructions have been clear since 1992, even if the, uh, there have been various problems in communication and execution, but the problems are fundamentally clear that security is not to be compromised. Yeah. And I was w perfectly willing to withstand tremendous criticism before the last set of hearings here on, on shutting the stacks. And if you just heard the professional advice is all that this is the kind of thing you have to do, but people as recently as a couple of months ago yeah. from the, uh, from, uh, were, were contending that they should, they would be even more secure if they were s still open. So, I mean, you, you can't, um, uh, there is just a lot of uh, entrenched uh, resistance to these things. But I, on the specific matter you, you raise, I, I, I will have to look into that because I can't say off the top of my head that there was any fundamental compromise to, to security, but I'd, I'd like to see if, if people felt that that was a problem. Well, I stated in the extreme example just to try to get a flavor of yeah. what would go on. You no, indicated that there was a willingness to negotiate to impasse. Uh, which seems to be a, a, a technique, and I'm familiar with that. Um, notwithstanding that your name is the Library of Congress and that uh, we have members of Congress overseeing you, if you uh, negotiate to impasse, where do you go to resolve your differences with the unions? Well, that goes to the federal, uh, whatever it is in the executive executive branch. Mm -hmm. Labor relations. Labor board. relations. So board, that yeah. in, in effect you in, in that profile you look more like an executive branch operation. Uh, I think this is one of the other things we're going to have to look at from a policy point of view. Uh, again when you talk about compression, uh, lack of a hierarchy and flexibility. Uh, I will be looking into the question of to what degree are we uh, going to be impeded with the current management labor structure, how could we possibly modify that not to reduce the rights uh, of the uh, employees or the obligations of management, but to make sure that it's done in a way that does not diminish our ability to move forward in a timely fashion? Because uh, I think as we look at the question of finances and that we look at the question of management, I think we focused on management rather narrowly. Uh, and to me, it is the uh, relations within the entire Library of Congress that ought to be focused on rather than some upper-level restructuring for management purposes. Notwithstanding that, I'd like to have you finish my segment of the questioning, if you want to, to reflect briefly on whether or not you think in the time that you have been librarian that the role of the Librarian of Congress is probably evolved into a structure in which coming out of these independent evaluations that you're going to see uh, uh, a day-to-day -day hands-on management structure which you will oversee in a broader policy way but which you will not be involved in. I know that wasn't an, an attempt at an earlier time to restructure it. I don't know whether it was successful or not. Do you believe it is? Is the direction that you're going now appropriate? Do you believe you need to be more of an ambassador as the Librarian of Congress rather than uh, uh, an on-site manager of the Library of Congress? Well, I think I've, um, uh, I've been both to a considerable extent. Oh, I know you've extent, been both. And I don't think that, uh, uh, that you can avoid that um, to some degree, but I think our structure uh, now is going to give us a um, better, firmer, and quicker. We're meeting more often. It's a smaller group. It's um, it's uh, it's going to, I think, uh, function um, considerably better uh, on on the management side. Um, but I think uh, I think yes. I mean, this um, this is a very large, complex organization. One of my in the last hearings. 93 hearings, um, one of the uh, people who testified uh, recalled uh, one of my distinguished predecessors, Archibald McLeish, saying the Library of Congress was more complex than the Pentagon. And that was when our collections were about a third the size they are now. Um, and um, uh, before all kinds of other problems, we have roughly 355 auditable units within the Library of Congress. It's a very complex uh, management team. And yet, the synergies within this institution are absolutely remarkable. I mean, the, the, you wouldn't have the collections without the copyright 
office. We wouldn't have the national record we have of American creativity and so forth. So that there's, there's some remarkable things uh, that, that happen as a result of this, the oldest, and the way it's grown. And I think there's a certain logic to it. And I think it's expressed in, the, in my integrated statement of, of mission and strategy. Um, but I think the, the um, uh, I think there's been a strong management burden up to the point where you get structures in place. I think we're in the process of get, finally getting structures in place that will be efficient for the new era. Um, and let me just say a word about labor relations, because I think there does need to be a better general atmosphere, and I think we're, we're going to make fresh efforts, as I indicated, um, on this. But there also has to be much better understanding of the need for change, of the fact that uh, and, and we're going to have to try to develop some new programs that will help people become knowledge navigators, which is what's needed, because we're going to need more, not less people if we're going to do, if we're going to make this kind of a universal collection really usable to the American people, because it's getting the amount of knowledge that's exploding in the world. Um, we, you know, our collections have doubled since 1970. <laughs> and, um, the, the security problem is not the only problem. Eight, one quarter of our books are to some extent embrittled. It's a preservation problem. There are enormous problems and there is enormous skill in the Library of Congress. What we needed is retraining, more development, and we're devoting, going to be devoting a lot of attention in the next period to retooling people. But it's going to take cooperation and we're going to have to have both on the part of managers and on the part of labor a realization that we're going to have to be more modern, we're going to have to change, we're not going to be able to think of the old inward looking, endless rehashing of, of internal processes as distinguished from focusing on mission and external service. That's, we're in the process of that now, we're going to be deriving budgets from a, uh, uh, from a general mission and strategy statement and I think it's going to be very important to have the kind of relationship you've mentioned with you are our board of governors to have a more intimate relationship so that we can really realize the full potential of this place, which is just, just colossal in the information age. Well, before I call on uh, Senator Pell, I would be remiss not to say that the other side of the coin of security is access and that the Library of Congress at the beginning of this uh, new Congress with the new majority was absolutely outstanding in its response to begin to go online. Uh, because I think that's one of the ways we can increase access to the collections. And that uh, I also have to, as a disclaimer, indicate that the Thomas system that you mentioned, which we initially called the House Open Media Access System, uh, and we utilize the bust of Thomas Jefferson since that's his first name, uh, that name is purely coincidental uh, in, in reference to my last name. Senator? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Billington, you said that it's been suggested uh, that supervisors might have been engaged in a cover-up of some kind of retaliatory uh, personnel action. Whether or not there was such actions, and I recognize these are allegations which may well prove to be false, I was wondering if you would tell us what steps you're taking to make sure that there's more quicker internal reporting of issues like that so you can intervene even more promptly. Um, what, to what are you referring, Senator? I'm not quite clear. Uh, uh, to, to the, oh, to the yeah. reference that uh, I believe it was Ms. Macheda felt that some retaliatory action had been taken against her. Oh, yes. Well, <clears throat> is Ms. Um, Macheda in the room by any chance? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if she was here. I, I really don't know. But, um, <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean, welcome. that was alleged. And, um, uh, uh, when it was alleged, I immediately instructed our Assistant Inspector General to, ex to um, exhaustively investigate uh, that, as well as, as um, other elements that were, that were uh, of concern um, in early August, and that investigation is, uh, is ongoing. Um, in the interim, I, I suspended all the administrative actions that, that were uh, had been taken with regard to her, so we're awaiting the full results of that. Thank you. I noticed in your testimony, preparing for this hearing, you, you focused on three areas, human resources, financial management, collection management. The fo focus is proper. I was wondering if you thought that your attention was diverted 
for the problems in the management structure. Uh, Senator, I'm afraid I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Maybe yeah. we can get the there. microphone a little sorry. closer. Thank you. I mumble. That's the problem. Uh, but uh, note from your testimony that you determined to focus on three areas, human resources, financial management, collection management. And I think that was a good focus, but I wondered if in retrospect you may have concluded that your attention was diverted from problems in management structure and internal reporting that became apparent last summer. I, I'm sorry, Senator. I, I really, I just didn't understand. Were you diverted? Your attention was diverted uh, from the uh, management structures to the internal reporting. Senator's question goes along oh. the line of you had a pre-planned approach to dealing with the various mm -hmm. management issues and that did the security concerns that come, came up last August and last summer divert your attention, your time, and your energy away from other projects toward this particular project, either as a reaction or as a necessity from your point of view. Is that correct, Senator? Yes. Yes, yes, um, yes they certainly have uh, thank, thank you. diverted an enormous amount of time and energy, particularly of our uh, most responsible people. Uh, this is a year we had a, a management restructuring online that was coming online anyhow. It wasn't a result of this. Um, it will have beneficial effects in assuring more better accountability and reporting on, um, on issues like security, but that was on track anyhow. What this has diverted us from has been the, the intensive application of high staff effort who are constantly having to answer often the same question over and over again <laughs> um, for many people. Um, from many different different sources, um, from um, from the from the task of, of deriving this year's budget. This was to be the year. This fiscal year, I met with my top managers, and I met with the next level of managers, um, and we were on a, on a very good track to really derive a budget in a disciplined way from a strategic plan, a station, mission, and goals that would help sort out the priorities that in a, in a time where we're, we're right-sizing down, but at the same time retooling for a new era. Those are difficult, complex questions, and we really haven't had time to address them because we're constantly, we have to constantly um, answer sorts of inquiries. Now, we're totally accountable. We're, we're, we're glad to do it, and we, as I say, we welcome deeper investigation. What we tend to get is repetitive questions. I mean, the recycling, for instance, of this misperception that an inventory of things discovered is an in inventory of things that happen. I mean, that just keeps recurring no matter how many times we correct it. And there's a, there's a kind of uh, enormous distraction that's involved. We're happy that we're totally accountable to the Congress. We want to be as responsive as we can. In fact, we, we seek it. We seek serious, sustained, professional discussion. That's why I, we welcome the GAO audit, why we bring in lots of consultants. But uh, there's no question that this process, um, uh, uh, when it becomes as extensive and repetitive as it's become, has a cost. And we are at a crucial, crucial stage of retooling. And I think uh, there is a tremendous cost in, in, in time, time and energy spent on process. The whole trick, one of my great criticisms of the university world that I came from is if you look at it, they've gone from substance to process. There are endless committees, the great increase in universities has been in administration, not in faculty. <coughs> um, we, the, the, we are anxious to slim down um, the administration. We've done it at the top. I think we can do it in other ways. Uh, but it's very difficult when the people who are trying to work out a new strategic plan so that we can, we can complete this mission of change and fulfill our innovative role are, are caught in, uh, in, you know, endless and repetitive things. So we're, we welcome the, the professionalism involved in the kind of consultants and the GAO, uh, uh, the GAO report, but, um, there is, certainly, um, there is certainly a cost in terms of diversion from the core tasks of management which we have been on and we will continue on. Right. But uh, frankly, I think uh, uh, it, some of our, our, our very best, it, it's our very best people who are, who are taking the leadership who are um, 
spending the most time on these other questions, too, and that's, that is costly. Right. Well, life without repetition would be great, or at least selective repetition. Sir? So life without repetition would be great, but I'm not sure it's applicable in politics, <laughs> except, except for selective repetition. That would be even more desirable. Uh, I was curious if you felt that your wonderful activity in fundraising and speaking as a taxpayer and on the oversight committee, very conscious of what you've done, has that diverted you from a bit from your regular uh, librarian type duties? I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's enabled us. Um, we wouldn't be getting a million hits a day electronically if I hadn't um, done some of this. And this unique private-public partnership that the Congress has, has endorsed in this year's and the congressional committees have endorsed um, wouldn't be possible if we weren't getting three private dollars for every one public one that was being invested. Um, I think this has uh, enormously um, helped and supplemented us in, in um, doing new things and, and uh, innovation. And uh, uh, even, you see, even in the question of security, for instance, I mean, this idea, is, uh, some, I suppose, have suggested, well, you know, why not be staying home tending to matters of security? In fact, this is extremely important for security because the more electronic surrogates get used, the less precious, unique documents have to be touched or, or handled by anyone. They can, you can use the surrogate. So this has a definite uh, contribution to, to security. The, um, and uh, I think that, um, uh, I mean, it's a strain to do this. I've, I've, you know, raised a great deal more money in the last eight years than had been raised in the previous 50. <laughs> um, well, good, good luck and keep it up. Well, I will, but I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, a, it's a strain, but I think it's, I think it's important. And it's also important not only from the point of view of money, but in this high technological age, we get a lot of, we have the money, but in this high technological age, we get a lot of, we have the chairman of the boards of major, um, I've created a Madison Council that never existed before. There was no development office any more than there was an IG or an audit before I became librarian in the development office. Um, and the Madison Council, which is nearly 100 people, includes the chairman of major high-tech companies from whom we get a lot of, of interesting advice. Okay. And nobody sets conditions that are unacceptable to us on this. It's, it's really been a net plus, I think. So um, it has taken some time to get it started. I think it shouldn't take as much time in the future to keep it going, but you never know. Everyone wants to talk to the boss. And of course, I have no, unlike other national cultural institutions, I have no board of regents or trustees and so forth to, to help with this. So it's a, considerable, it's a considerable burden. But I would like to say I do much of it on weekends. Um, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's in addition to everything else. I think it's, I think it's important. I think it's, I think it's useful. Thank and I, you. I think it's sort of unavoidable. Good. Thank you and well done. Thank you, Senator. Gentleman from Arizona, wish to inquire? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, basically, two questions. As I read your testimony and seen your charts, uh, there's a trend to downsize, so that means less personnel, uh, but yet you have uh, more demand for the use of the library, you have more materials coming in. In 1992, you started with your, with your plan, and I guess you were going forward. But now with the GAO uh, coming forth with recommendations of how to implement a new financial management system, and you'll have another outside consultant looking at your management and recommending that. If you are successful with a statutory IG, that's going to have more demands on resources and time. You have the security situation. So you have all these new demands on you that have popped up very recently. Uh, my question is, looking at all those circumstances, how has your 92 plan changed in the short term? And what changes do you think you'll have to adjust to in the long term, meaning 
next couple of years. You mean on security or? On the whole thing. I mean, how, how does this affect the whole operation? Yes, In your mind, now that you've encountered new, new challenges. Well, we're pretty much on track with the broad outlines of our strategic plan, which called in the first phase from 93 to 96 to emphasize the infrastructure problems of, uh, uh, with particular priority to uh, security, to arrearages, and to, um, uh, to human uh, resource uh, management. Um, uh, and while we were, of course, working on the financial improvement plan, which had started back in 1990. So, uh, and to explore the electronic outlet. The next phase that we're entering into now, um, and we'll, through the year 2000, as, as the original broad strategic plan called for, for, um, for our, our going from the pilot into an operational stage on, on electronic delivery. And we're doing that with the National Digital Library and our plan. We're on track with our plan to, uh, to digitize 5 million items. We've digitized about 500,000. Thanks to the, the wisdom and the vision of the Congress, our American Memory Project it was tested in 44 sites around the country over five years and proved an extraordinary success. So that we're, the, the educational impact, in addition to the informational impact of the library, will be very substantial. And that's a priority item for, for the next uh, stage of our strategic plan. Um, what, what we are, are trying to do now, as I say, is to, is to um, develop from the from the mission statement a, and out of our new management structure, a system that will be, um, uh, that will be uh, more efficient both in managing the, the ongoing um, infrastructure problems and at the same time um, moving us into the electronic age with a mixed uh, private public um, funding uh, that we've laid the groundwork for in our fundraising. So basically, we're on track with this, but as you say, this is a, a colossal um, uh, task because the, the, the information needs um, take the Internet, in which we're one of the major important information and educational uh, content providers on the Internet. What it needs is the two things that precisely the Library of Congress has to offer in spades, namely solid content that's of educational value and ultimately, by the way, of economic and productivity value. I see that as an, the next emerging frontier of electronic survival so that we're going to be directly addressing national needs and directly servicing people directly in your constituencies. That's a tremendously important thing for the country. The Congress has had the vision to endorse this and we're going to move ahead with it. But in order to do that, and in order to help people navigate in this increasing ocean of information that's drowning everybody, we're going to have to retool a lot of our staff into knowledge navigators. That's why I see um, increased importance to the issues of human development. So I think, as some of our uh, labor people have sometimes said, we, the problem is not so much we should be thinking of right-sizing rather than downsizing. And that's why I want to, uh, I want to stress that uh, we, we, we've got to think creatively about getting people um, uh, retrained, rethinking. That's why we're talking about this concept of an internal university. So how we can develop without additional resources, realizing it's a time of constriction, nevertheless using mentoring, using new techniques so that the enormous talent that is in the library can be transferred from, from one person to another. But again, we need cooperation so that we get the flexibility and we don't have this rigid dig digging in to old structures, old turf, um, rendlessly rehashing of old adversarial problems which are just holding us back from the new, the new tasks and the new possibilities of the future. So that's an exciting um, task. I think our people are, are anxious to, to get on with it, but it has, has required some of those new emphasis I've tried to. I'm not sure if I've addressed your question, Mr. Pastor. Well, it, it would I be correct in, in saying that from your answer I could determine that the new opportunities you have with the GAO bringing in a financial management system that will be developed and implemented, the new management system, the, all the security that will be 
uh, recommended and implemented and the statutory IG that that would have a minimal impact on your uh, plan that you developed in 92. Is that a correct assessment? Because that's how I am assessing uh, the impact by, by your response. So, that the imp so all the things that you'll be asked to do from what I heard in today's testimony that basically that will only be minimal in, in changes and in resources to your 92 plan. Or is it going to be greater than I mean? Well, I, it's, it's hard to say in advance of the studies and in advance of seeing how these things operate. But yes, I think fundamentally, the the task of getting getting on with the with the enormously demanding tasks that we face and the tremendous opportunities for the country that are inherent in having the world's greatest supply of information here at the capital in the, in the as we're entering the information age and the leadership role we've already established electronically. Um, yeah, we ought to be getting on with those tasks, and there's no question that there's there's a trade-off. I mean, the number of um, there's always a question of the number of examinations that tell you things you more or less already knew <coughs> uh, it takes oftentimes the attention of the people away who are in the process of fixing them, but have to spend their lives explaining um, what they're doing, not only what they're doing now, but what somebody else might have done ten years ago. <coughs> Uh, this is a distraction, which is not to say that we are opposed to any kind of examination. We, the, more the, the more the better, because we learn something from that, too, and I'm sure we'll learn something useful from this, too. But it does get us, we do want to keep our mind, as we're doing these things, on the big picture, the tremendous demands that, on this institution and the tremendous possibilities it has. I mean, just, just yesterday I was uh, talking with somebody who pointed out that AID has just done a study of, of, of what are the most cost-efficient things we've done abroad. And one of them is, is the building infrastructures for the parliaments and the emerging new democracies in Eastern Europe. This got rave notices. Well, this, is a, this was something that CRS has done, the library has done at congressional request. We're scaling that down now because it's, uh, uh, but it was, it it's only illustrates one of the, any number of remarkable things, delivering 23 million items a year free to the blind and physically handicapped around this country is a, is a lifeline into reading, and that's another area of increase. So um, there is just, this is just a tremendous um, dynamo uh, of possibility. Uh, and our people, I think, both have, we have a structure and we have a, a motivation and an interest to turn from a past that's often been full of adversarial and, and turf-related things and to shape a new future, building as the modern management does, deriving budgets from a strategic plan. But that requires a lot of innovation, a lot of change. It's going to require a lot of understanding from both our workforce and from, and from, the, from the Congress. But yes, I think these are the tasks we need to concentrate concentrate on if this institution is going to continue to play the, the central role that it can and indeed the enhanced role that I think it is already playing. In, in your opinion, if the IEG becomes statutory and many of us then are going to have to vote for that legislation, in your opinion, do you think that it will make the management and the administration of the library more effective, and do you think will it in fact uh, save money? And, and it, will the Library of Congress be a better Library of Congress if, in fact, we do have a statutory Inspector General? <clears throat> well, I don't. Um, it. I, I don't know how much practical differences make because, in terms of independence, the IG has always had um, complete independence. Uh, the. Um, I think. Uh, probably more important is the increase in resources. I think the addition of subpoena power is important, and I think there, there are other elements that, um, uh, that, uh, that may be helpful. But this is, it, it's, it's not a, as big or fundamental uh, issue, I, I don't believe, as it, it may be made to appear. Uh, I, I think the more important thing in terms of the future function of the IG will be some, some added resources. Um, but again, there's always a trade-off in these things between devoting resources 
to somebody who's in the process of fixing the problem and somebody who is, who is uh, you know, investigating whether it's being fixed or not. And we haven't had the luxury of, uh, as I pointed out, I mean, the, the IG did get some increased resources. We're going to add more now since the, uh, there seems to be more receptivity to it, and I hope it will, will, we have every hope that it will make a difference and be helpful. During the break, I mentioned to uh, my, my colleagues uh, that were having lunch that we were going to increase the security at the library and probably do a reassessment of the inventory of books. And they all said that, uh, please give us all a grace period in returning the overdue books. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Please give us a grace period in returning all the overdue books. So. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to... <laughs> Do Dr. Billington, I think that was his closing no. comment. Oh, I was <laughs> the chairman wish Thank to inquire? You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Billington, you and I have known each other for many, many years and worked together on a lot of things. Um, one of them I remember so well, that uh, the Soviet Union. You are recognized throughout the world as one of the experts on the former Soviet Union and indeed today on Russia, which leads me to the point that I like to think of the, the librarian of Congress having adequate time to spend on matters of great challenge other than daily management. And that you, uh, having established your credibility in a very important area for our country, security, and your successors would do likewise, whatever they may be. Some may wish to uh, apply it in other areas. But my concern is that with the growing size of the library, the responsibilities, the changing problems in our society requiring surveillance and whatever, that more and more of the librarian of Congress's time is taken to management and less and less devoted to how to make this library and all the libraries in the United States better. I would hope each day you get up and that's your challenge, and I think you've recited that to me. Is there not an opportunity here at this juncture for this committee and the Rules Committee and the counterparts in the House to look at a uh, elevation of an individual to a number two status, and that's the day-by-day hands-on manager. And at any time you want to go down, of course, it is yours to manage as you see fit together with your number two. Uh, for example, in the Department of Defense, where I spent many years as Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary had to travel the world, still does. He had all sorts of challenges and problems. And the Deputy Secretary of Defense was the hands-on manager day after day after day. And the system worked then and does today work very well. Have you, um, yes, the Smithsonian, my able colleague, uh, I served on the board of the Smithsonian as a region, I did uh, a distinguished senator from Rhode Island. Uh, that system is followed there because We've always looked at the overall head of the Smithsonian as a man of great intellect and a man who should work with others to foster greatness in that complex of museums and so forth. Would you consider that, and if you prefer to answer it for the record or reflect on it, and in no way does this reflect on your ability to do that. It's just my concern that perhaps a stronger number two position would enable you to and your successors to devote more attention to improving the overall library system of the United States and less day hands-on with management problems. Mm -hmm. No, well, I'd be, be glad to answer that. We're in the process of, um, of um, you know, installing our new management system with the executive. The, 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 the two um, areas of the library, one dealing with the whole support structures, infrastructure questions, and also the National Digital Library are in the hands of one line manager and library services now, which used to be in three different service units, have been consolidated to one under another manager. So I think there's effective accountability, plus the other things that have statutory, um, um, like CRS and the Register of Copyrights. Uh, so there isn't that large a span. There's, 
of, 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 of top management. It's a, it's a much smaller set of unit. It's meeting much more frequently. I can answer to, to you, um, uh, Senator, in, in great detail, but I, I, I think the, uh, the question of crafting the right um, management structure for the library is very much on our mind. I think, I think we're, we're learning as we go along with this new executive committee system. I think it's working well, but I'll answer in, in, in more detail Fine, to you. In because, uh, I would I, say one thing that in terms I of... I intend to actually uh, throw, uh, 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 submit a proposal to this uh, committee on the library and, and eventually up to the full rules committee, but I would uh, do so only after uh, listening very carefully to your views. Thank you. I just, I've seen this system work elsewhere. And um, yeah. I think it deserves uh, consideration as we Senator, approach it. Yes. For just a moment. I think two years or so ago, we, we approved the filling of a deputy librarian, which I was under the impression at the time that that was to do um, much of the job description of the deputy was to do a lot of the day-to-day -day management work. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Doctor? Yes, that's, that's, that is uh, right. So we have... Uh, well, I, I see it noted here in your... Uh, your letter of uh, September 15th, the Deputy Librarian Overall Library Issues. No. We were going to, um, uh, the, uh, one of the problems in general management, we, I think we have a good balance um, among our senior managers now. We have certainly much more human diversity. We have good balance between people who've been brought in from the outside with other experience and people with inside. I would remind you, though, that the, uh, the pay level the Library of Congress is not really competitive with, even with other cultural institutions, let alone with, with institutions in the private sector that perform operations of anything like the complexity and skill that we do. So um, it isn't always easy to, particularly to hire managers who are uh, as such. Um, but I think we have some extraordinary talent, the, particularly those, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, two people who've acquired increased responsibility uh, I've been um, are people that were in the middle level of management when I arrived and they've been well tested and proven and I think you can feel that the that those those um, responsibilities are in pretty good hands but I'll, I'll respond all right. on all of this I in think, more well, detail thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> California Chairman Packard wish to inquire I think the public all feels that government employees are overpaid and uh, the public feels that way including members of Congress and uh, especially members of Congress um, just following up on Mr. Pasteur's um, um, comment relative to the Inspector General, uh, and you mentioned and, and discussed your, the conflict that you have with trying to develop priorities as to where to put your resources, uh, we did notice, or I did notice, that uh, you've increased your congressional relations personnel from 2.5 in 91 to 8.0 um, in 95, and your Inspector General's was increased less than one during that same period of time. So um, I'm just curious as to where those priorities uh, would, would tend to lead us, uh, whether a congressional relations is a, is, is a significantly three times as many increased in personnel as IG. Um, we have an awful lot of congressional inquiries. Okay. I, I'm sure that's true, and I'm sure that it's very important that you feel uh, that your relationship with the Congress re is, is maintained, but certainly the Inspector General, I think, had some justification in feeling that he was, his department was undermanned. Um, I, I wanted to, the, the main thrust of my staying, though, for the, for the remainder of the hearing and to make it my input was to try to <coughs> disabuse, at least officially for the record, disabuse the concept or the notion that... Uh, that the problem uh, that we've experienced at the library is due to a lack of funding or a lack of being responsive to the funding requests of the library. Um, my recollection and my information is that uh, in 1993, and that's where we go back to, uh, that there was a reprogramming request, a letter of reprogramming request for $320,000, I'll round it off, $320,000 on February uh, uh, of 93, and that the committee improved the entire request for that year. In 94, uh, there was a request uh, in your budget request for $2.6 million of direct, directly related expenses for security at the library. Uh, that you revised, and uh, we received a revised request um, 
uh, bringing it uh, down to 1.4 million instead of the 2.6, and that was completely and, and fully funded as requested, uh, revised request. In 94, or 90, um, yes, 95, we, um, where's my paper? Um, the request for reprogramming was $343,000, and that was granted. And for 96 reprogramming, the request is for um, 4.85, and uh, uh, we, we intend to approve that. But I would like to, and, and first of all, before I get to the, to the, to the current reprogramming request, um, are, is your recollection of these same statistical uh, information same as, or s similar to what I have just expressed? I think so, and I think those were compatible with the figures that I, I used before, They're and I, I was not in any way minimizing the... Uh, uh, you know, here I have the... I, I think have. for the point I, I wish to make, uh, uh, particularly for the record, is, is that I think the committee, the appropriation subcommittees, uh, have been responsive to the security needs of the library in terms of funding requests. And to my knowledge, every request uh, you, you have received for either reprogramming or for budget levels, even though one of them was a revised request, and I do not recall, I was not on the subcommittee at the time. Maybe I was on the subcommittee at the time when the revised request was, was brought to us. Uh, but at any rate, um, I wanted to make certain that the record showed that, that, that it has not been a lack of funding to my knowledge. And even when, when there was not reprogramming requested, you internally funded what you felt needed to be done. So the money was there. And that's the point I think we need to make. Relative to the reprogramming request that now is pending um, for this year uh, for the IG uh, um, in, Inspector General, uh, we will. We want to be supportive of that request, but I do question uh, the validity or the the, the w wisdom of taking those funds from the automa automation program. I think that is of, of high priority. I think to most of us, including yourself, and I and I'm not sure, but what there might be other other ways to to um, cover that reprogramming rather than taking it out of the automation system. And I'd like you to at least consider that, if you would. Yes, sir. Well, we are happy to discuss that with you, and I, I was and, not... And my, my whole uh, purpose, I think, for being invited here was not to deal with the problems at the library as much as it was to look at the funding and the appropriation process, and I, I wanted to make sure that we were clear on that before we right. close Gentlemen, this hearing. Gentlemen's questions were well directed, and obviously the library will uh, respond, and we're going to have an ongoing dialogue uh, because obviously they're attempting to make sure the finances meet their needs, once again, I want to do it on a prospective basis following a policy, and we're going to put that uh, mechanism in place. Mr. Chairman, I did not either mention in my testimony or, or, or uh, prominently feature in when I was asked what the obstacles were, the question of finances. I think the committee has been, been very supportive. <clears throat> I was simply pointing out that it was, um, uh, it was in the area of constant reprogramming and that... Um, uh, I think we've worked cooperatively very well. Um, uh, and I also pointed out in my testimony that uh, no matter how much there is, there's still going to be problems. So um, um, we appreciate what the committee's done. And uh, I, I don't think there's any incompatibility between the figures you cited, which are very generous in terms of allowing us to reprogram. And the point that I made when I was, was questioned about it, which was how much did we actually request new money and we understand and we modified our request in discussing and we think that uh, I mean there's just no question that the appropriations committees in this difficult time have been extremely generous with the, with uh, the Library of Congress so uh, we're uh, we're grateful for that at the same time I think I, I think the committees realize it but I don't think many people do that the Library of Congress is not just another legislative branch agency I mean it is a unique um, powerful resource and the Congress has been very wise and 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 generous in in recognizing that in a difficult time within the within the legislative branch so uh, we appreciate the help you've given us mr. chairman and, and look forward to working with you in terms of these other reallocations and difficult decisions we have to make 
Dr. Billing, I want to reiterate um, Chairman Hatfield's statement that there may be additional questions from other members who were not uh, able to be here, and we expect some timely response. Uh, on again behalf of uh, Chairman Hatfield, I want to thank the members of the Appropriate Appropriations Committees uh, for attending. I want to thank all of the witnesses, especially uh, Dr. Billington. This is the uh, first hearing, and I believe we've laid a, uh, a very useful structure and uh, groundwork uh, to make some progress in additional hearings. Uh, this joint committee uh, uh, hearing on the library is adjourned. In an hour, we'll have Republican presidential candidate Pat Buchanan discussing his campaign strategy, Republican politics, and issues in the 96th presidential election. The House and Senate are adjourned until Monday, January 22nd. A bill temporarily funding the government expires.